Welcome to the uh, Finance Committee meeting for July 18th. Uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, take a moment of silence for the uh, three police officers slain yesterday in uh, Louisiana, and since it's been a long month since we've met countless other uh, police officers and senseless shootings, and our friends in France and Istanbul. So if you could all uh, take a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Madam Clerk, item number one. Order that the City Council approves a request for an exemption from Article 3, Section 2-110 of the Revised Ordinance. Invited John Crowley, Police Chief. Mr. Chairman. Councilor, Councilor Sullivan. In light of the fact that this is a personnel matter, uh, and we have uh, collectively as City Councilors and Finance Committee members received the letter, uh, if my uh, counselors don't object, I'm going to make a favorable recommendation back to the full city council. On second. The second. Everyone. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably full city council. Item number two. Ordinance. An ordinance amending Chapter 2 of the revised ordinances of the City of Rockton by amending Division 2, the Employee Classification Plan. Invited John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Chairman. First like of all, good, good evening, Mr. Condon. Good evening. Councilor. I'd like to um, send this back to ordinance. Second. Motion was made and uh, properly seconded to send it back to Finance Committee. Ordinance. ordinance. I'm sorry, the Ordinance Committee. All in favor, please raise your hand. I'm going to take a roll call vote on that if we could, please. On the motion, Mr. President. On Councilor Stadensky, on the motion. It's been an ordinance one time, we, and we're going to send it back there again? Right. That's the yes, motion, it, there was some um, question. This was supposed to go back to ordinance, but it was put on the f uh, finance agenda, and I thought it was taken care of, so that's why we're sending it back to ordinance. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you, Councilor. Councilor. Motion was made and properly seconded. You know what? We won't do a roll call. We're going to do a hand again. Let's get the hands up. All in favor, send it back to ordinance. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And item number three, please. Order appropriation, 142,000 from the unappropriated estimated receipts, ordinary revenue, fiscal year 2017, to the police department overtime to provide additional funding in the police overtime budget to ensure con continuity of services in the months of August and September. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John Acon and Chief Financial Officer, John Crowley, Police Chief. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Uh, good evening, Councilors. Uh, during the uh, the budget hearings uh, and in the adoption of the budget, the City Council cut uh, $340,000 uh, from the police budget. Uh, about $250,000 of that was from the overtime account and $90,000 of that was from the uh, <clears throat> salary account, the personal services account. So in this appropriation and actually in the one that follows, we're seeking to reappropriate some portion of that. Uh, in this first instance, the appropriation is to restore some of that overtime funding. Uh, the, uh, the chief and the mayor and I as well are all concerned that the amount of funding in the budget at the moment is really not sufficient to the city's needs and we're in the highest portion of overtime usage in the summer months. And so we'd like, uh, rather than having uh, some concern as to whether the funds would last and we can get a favorable vote for, for additional money later, we'd like to get some of that money put back now and that's what this request is for. Jim. Councilor Rianieri. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Condon. How are you? Good. Um, I, I guess my, my question, um, I don't know if I want to say if it's a real question or more or less a statement before a question, but just in how you, you know, just in, enlightened everybody here to what we had done as a council during the budget process, and just in my mind, knowing that I've still left you with probably about $772,000 to work with, I understand the concern that we all have in regards to the amount of money that can be used during the summer months. But I just don't get the fact that why are we in such a rush to put an X amount of dollars back when, when still we haven't gone through the summer months yet. Right. Uh, we're, we're going through that process now, and, and maybe you know September, October would be more of a rationale type of time for us to, to see or hear from you know, uh, you know, the police department or you as the chief financial officer or the mayor making a request that we're now in, in some need. But I'm just... I don't know, I'm missing the boat, and, 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 and I'm not the only one. I mean, residents that have even questioned me and said, what's the problem? You got $772,000 to work with, but yet we still need 142000 to get us through the summer months. Have we already gone through 
$772,000 and we just started on July 1st. I'm, miss, I'm, I'm missing it. Maybe I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I must be far out to ocean, I guess. I don't know. Maybe I'll, you can explain I'll try to, to me. explain it. The problem that I, as the chief financial officer, have, not the mayor, this is me speaking from my own personal okay. perspective, is that the appropriation is an appropriation for the full year. There is no guarantee. I think everybody in here says, come back and we'll give you the money. But nobody can be certain that if that appropriation request is made, it's going to be granted. So the chief is in a position, I think, in order to be fiscally prudent, he ought to be spending at a rate which is commensurate with being able to make that appropriation last for the year. I don't believe any of us think that that can be accomplished, that the budget that was submitted by the mayor was already $100,000 less than the budget that was approved for the, through a, with the additional appropriations that were made during last fiscal year for the year. It was already down $100,000. So the concern is if he spends at a rate which exhausts most of this appropriation, and I think um, last year they spent about 400 and some odd thousand dollars in the summer month. So you'll be out to the September, October, November time frame, nearly out of money for the whole year. So the request is give us some portion of that back. We understand that the city council is looking to, con to continue a um, dialogue, let's call it, with, the, with right. the city executive branch on the use of police overtime. But our, our view is that $250,000 is a steep cut, especially with a, a difficult summer coming up and especially with what's going on in the, in the, in the, uh -huh. in the country right now. Um, this appropriation was, re was requested prior to the police killings in Dallas and in Louisiana, but I think it heightens our concern as to the availability. So you're correct. We haven't gone through $770,000. We will not go through that in all likelihood between now and the end of September, but we'll go through a lot of it. And he has to be sure that he can make that appropriation last for the year. Otherwise, you could rightly criticize him. What are you doing spending money at a rate and then coming back to us and putting us in a position where we have to give you additional money because you'll be out and we can't afford to have that happen. Right. That's, that's, the, that's the rationale. And, and and it makes sense. I'm not, I'm not saying what you're saying to us this evening or, or, or people listening or people here that does not make sense. Of course it makes sense because you always do make sense when it comes to the financial aspects of, of what we're trying to do here in the city. It just, it just bewilders me on, on, on how we're doing it and moving so fast. And, and I truly understand yep. the situation that, you know, we are a department that is still un, un, unmanded, women, whatever. I mean, we don't have the force that we want, um, no doubt about it. And I, and I can see that, you know, with... With the process that's going on throughout the country, I mean, we're all concerned. And, and I don't think at any given time, um, even by you coming here and asking some money now, whether you come back in September. And I don't think at any given time, since I've been involved as a councilor, even when I had years on the school committee, whatever, it, you never saw any city council, any city council say no to public safety. And you know that would never happen. You know what I mean? It's just the way it's being presented after doing a budget, just starting a new year, and, and we're already into a need. But you do make sense in what you're saying, and, and I think that it need to be explained. Um, it's understandable. Um, but again, you know, I, I just, I, I don't want to see a rhythm that we're, still going to come back in October and say we're almost out. That's, that's a concern that I have, but I guess that's a chance that we take. So right. that's why I asked the question. Um, and I'm I not, understand where the council is coming and from. I, and I'm not, and I'm not saying, I'm speaking as me, it's my, but I'm, I'm sure some of the councils probably echo some of the same thoughts because, in, and again, I just repeat it, I don't want anyone to ever, ever think that we are ever opposed to public safety in this city because we are not. That's, that's what we build our reputation on. That's what we run for public office on is because the one thing, God, the one thing I want is to make sure that, that things are safe. And I know, and I just say this quickly a few times when, when the mayor was out of town last year and I was council president, I mean, and he, and he was out of town, out of, out of the country. The biggest concern I ever had was being council president to have to step up to bat would to be have to take and, and have to look at some type of situations that we've had happen in other parts of this country because I don't know how I would have handled it myself. I mean, it would have truly been a blow to my heart and you with me and in the chief and everybody, you know what I mean? So I have that great concern. So with that being explained to me, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to show my support to it, but I just want to make sure it was broken down and people understand, understand it. Council. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Farwell. Yes, good evening, Mr. Condon. Since I set in motion, I guess, all of the dialogue about this particular issue, uh, I'd like to review a couple of things. We did reduce the overtime appropriation by 250000 but what we've never mentioned is that we left $75,500 for license enforcement, and we left $244,600 for the mayor's safety initiative, which right. I assume is at his discretion to spend as he sees fit to address different crime issues. Right. 
That left $1,090,100 to start the fiscal year July 1st. There has to be some incentive to department heads to carefully manage an appropriation <clears throat> and not write a blank check for over a million dollars and just say, here you go, do what you want with it, the council is satisfied, we're not going to visit this issue again. And I think we made it pretty clear that the reason for the reduction was because, just as we did in 2016, we appropriated additional funds to the police department for overtime. As a matter of fact, the mayor was quoted in the Enterprise in December saying, it's true that police overtime issue is pressing, but he said that the regular police payroll is, account is under budget because the department was undermanned. He said that he and the police chief will soon approach the newly elected council <clears throat> with a request to transfer money between the accounts to make the overtime last until the end of the fiscal year, which will be in fiscal year 2016. It's a shifting of already budgeted money, Carpenter said. Carpenter said this type of request typically takes place every fiscal year in Brockton. And then he went on to say, which I agree with, Carpenter said that the overtime issue will soon be eased by nine new police officers who are in on-the-job training, which will end in about a month, for a total of 184 Brockton officers. By next year, there will be 14 additional officers on top of that after a frustratingly long civil service process. We've also read in the paper where thankfully, and I know everyone here is appreciative of the fact, the homicide rate is down. That means less court time. That means fewer grand jury appearances. That means fewer officers going in to testify at a motion to suppress or a motion to uh, uh, dismiss uh, charges against uh, defendants. I cannot fathom how you and the mayor and the police chief can't start off with a million ninety thousand dollars and spend that appropriately and get us through the summer months because last year in July 1st, 2015, uh, strike that, July 1st, 2015 to September 30th, 2015, for overtime we spent $356,584.82. We spent $21,333.99 for license enforcement and the mayor's safety initiative, we only spent $34,217.27. There is adequate money there to get us well through the fiscal year. I don't think anybody, anybody is disputing that, Counselor. My, well, it, my well, argument was that, first of all, the public safety incentive money, the uh, mayor's public safety money, is the same level as last year, and so is the license. So you've simply level funded those two accounts. My argument, Counselor, is not that there isn't sufficient money to get deep into the fiscal year, but in terms of financial practice, that was a substantial cut to that account, a 25% cut to that account approximately. That's a deep cut, and it can't be certain, it's probable, but it can't be certain that when the chief comes back and asks for that money, he's going to get it. So we're asking for a portion of it to be restored so he can manage within the amount of money that then would be available to him. If he doesn't get it, I think he'll have to be more cautious in how he spends money in the next few months than he otherwise would be. Nobody could blame him, I don't think, if he decides to go and spend at the rate he spent last year and then deal with the with a shortage that may emerge in, in March. I don't think it would be responsible of the council to criticize him if he does that. I'm just saying from a fiscal perspective, I don't think that's a particularly good practice. I think a 5% cut, a 6% cut, something like that, or even a 10% cut is within the bounds where maybe you might be able to handle it with management discretion. 25% is saying we know there's going to be a significant shortfall if everything goes as it has in the past in terms of police practices, and we're going to force him to come back and ask for that additional money. And he's managing to an appropriation where he only knows he's got the $750,000. That's all he, I'm not just and, in, that, and, in that account. And that is true of every city department. We just had a seven alarm fire. The fire department was given far less overtime. Yep. If they have a series of seven alarm fires, they'll be coming back yeah, here that's to right. ask us that's for, right. for more that's right. uh, overtime funds. And we're just saying as a council, which every city council in Massachusetts does, we will give you a significant appropriation. But we are not going to give you that size appropriation with absolutely no oversight and without understanding how the money is being spent. And I do not believe that's unreasonable. And I think that's why people sent us here, to be the guardian of taxpayer money. Well, I'm not disputing that, Counselor. I'm not, I'm not calling your actions unreasonable. Okay. I'm saying I have a, have a different perspective as to whether it was too deep or not. I'm not saying it's unreasonable. I'm not saying that you're not doing what you think is the right thing in terms of uh, representing the taxpayer's interest. And I'm not 
really trying to describe how it is that the chief manages his overtime budget. You know, we rely on him to do that. I'm simply saying why it is that as a chief financial officer, I can be supportive just a few weeks after the uh, $250,000 cut, a request for a portion of that to be restored. I, I, don't, I don't look to be argumentative with, with the council on this. I know where you were going on that. I know what your attempt was to do was to show fiscal responsibility and restraint in spending on a big account. I'm just saying maybe too big, that's, that's all. And, I, and I'm just saying that you've got a significant amount of money, yeah. and I do not believe it's unreasonable for us to say, if you need more, come back. Yeah. And, and I think in your professional career here, which began about the time when I was in the mayor's office, we have never seen a council turn its back on a public safety department. No, I don't believe so. Not on overtime, no. We have, we have not. No. no. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Gordon. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you um, for, uh, for what you do for the city of Brockton. Um, <clears throat> however, I, I, do, uh, I do want to say that I, I, I just I don't understand this request. And having just gone through my 11th budget, mm -hmm. um, again, this, this city council, this legislative body has always been an ally for public safety, be it fire, police. It, it, it always has. Hires, promotions appropriations, equipment, cruisers, whatever it is. Und undisputed. But, but what I just, I can't understand as, I'll take my city council hat off, and as a taxpayer, I just, I can't understand as, as a common sense person that runs my own household, why a budget has just been ratified 18 days ago at certain amount, okay, that very, very small percentage of that amount has even been spent. Yet, we can look at past history, last summer was about 400,000. So even if 400 grand is spent in today's mm -hmm. midsummer, July 18th, say 400 grand is spent, you still have another $350,000 right. buffer. So what I don't understand, I guess, and, and, and I'm not going to support this at this time, I will support it after the fact when the department head comes before us and the mayor comes before us and says, listen, the 750,000 was spent on this for this reason, we need more money. That's the way it's always been as long as I've been on the city council and hopefully it always will right. be. And I understand your perspective on that. Again, my point is, we all know he'll be spending more than 750000 Over the term. Over the, over the year. Over the term, over the right, year. over the fiscal year. That's right. But with a cut of that size, it is difficult for the person who's in charge of the spending to be able to know what is the rate at which he can safely spend knowing he'll be able to get city council support. If he were to come back and ask for 500000 or 600000 not just the quarter of a million, because he spent that much, Will, would that be supported? It injects a level of uncertainty, which I think is a little bit difficult in a fiscal environment for a responsible uh, manager to manage within. Not that you haven't the right to try to put a tight leash on overtime. We all know that, on the other hand, though, that the overtime account is not just uh, for frivolous needs because it provides staffing on the street, pu actual public safety hours, in place of having actual additional staff, and in many cases at a cheaper rate than it would be to hire that staff and staff up to the level that perhaps we, uh, many would like to see and incur the pension costs and the health costs, and, you know, the vacation days, all those other things. So this, this provides staffing on the street, not just overtime for the existing offices, a dual purpose. So I, I, I'm, I agree not, with you I'm trying not to argue with you, Councilor, because no, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I don't dispute that you'd get the money. He just doesn't know what the real rate to spend at is. With a but the real rate to spend, you can look at a, at a fiscal historical analysis of prior years. That's how you budget. So you say 400 <clears throat> last year, maybe it was you know 300 the year right. previous. So you have a buffer and you know what you can spend within your realm within those fiscal months. So with that being said, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Condon. Council Burns. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Condon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, last year, this same kind of thing happened. Oh, actually, 2015, I, I think it was, um, where the chief at the time, Chief Hayden, came back for um, additional funding for the overtime budget um, when he had employed uh, the van and um, started doing, I think, more street patrols and the bikes and all those other kinds of things. And um, if I remember correctly, and this is kind of, I, I guess, what I want you to clarify for me, if you don't mind, when they came back for the funding before the end of the fiscal year, where did that funding come from? Because it was like an $800,000 allotment from something to something. Do, do you recall? I don't recall that, that specific transfer. Many times the appropriation would come, uh, if not from the stabilization fund, if it's a real emergency, it would come from internal monies within the police budget 
in the salaries account that weren't spent because you didn't have the full staff that was anticipated. Perhaps you'd anticipated getting people into an academy, say, in, in September, and because we're uh, dependent upon the, uh, the state for the running of that academy, we wouldn't get them in until January. So you may be eight or nine offices for four or five months where the money was budgeted, it wasn't spent. So it could have come from that source. I really don't remember. But that's a typical source for, fend for funding overtime request in this budget. Because I, I seem to remember it was something about unestimated receipts. Does that? Well, this uh, uh, unappropriated estimated receipts can be spent until you set the tax rate. And they come from two sources. At this point, usually we know the state aid, so it's, that's no longer a source. Uh, but it is from extra growth in the tax levy, mm -hmm. not, uh, not two and a half, but new growth. Or if we've been conservative in estimating the other local receipts and take a look at, because we prepare the budget in April and May, mm -hmm. we take a look at the June receipts and say we could have put a little bit more in it, we can do it there. Or it comes from city council cuts, which is what this one is. It's from okay. city council cuts. And in your, your professional opinion, are we on track to have that again, some, some of those... Um additional money is going in terms forward. of in terms of the tax levy uh, we were a little bit more aggressive in what we estimated this year in terms of growth there may be a bit more than what we estimated I'd like to talk to the assessor before I gave you a specific promise on that I see in terms of the, uh, the the local receipts the other local receipts that is estimated at a higher level this year the City Council adopted some uh, fee increases last year they were realized during the course of fiscal 16 and we, we put them into the fiscal 17, so I don't think you'll see a source there. But you did cut several hundred thousand dollars out of the budget in addition to the police department cut. Came out of the treasurer's uh, short-term debt budget where we didn't really need it. I don't think we fully appropriated all that yet, so there is some left, yes. Okay, so technically or, or philosophically, if we were to not allow this particular request at this time, there is potential for um, some other funding down the road. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone else? Let's stand a motion. Mr. Chairman, could I uh, ask a question of the Chief of Police if he's in the... You certainly room? can. Chief Crowley. Thank you. Good evening, Chief. Good to see you again. Good evening, sir. Are we moving, or are you moving as a chief, are you moving back towards community policing? Yes. We're, okay. We're constantly trying to embrace the community and be more involved with the community. Um, we have four to 12 shift has their community police beats. The day shift has our community resource offices that are out. Um, but we're always looking to improve it. Okay. I, now, you're still applying for all the different grants that are out there. Yes. Shannon, through anything, through any yes. name, any type. And, and we've always been pretty well funded within that area. Do we get a chance to use that for some of the extras? Sometimes, but there's restrictions on where that money can be spent and how right. it can be spent. But if we can, we do. Okay, so there's no, there's no real big drive, though, to move back to community policing. I mean, throughout the nation, that's the word you're hearing. The buzzword right, it, from the 90s is right. there. It, I mean, it's coming it's back. It's something that worked in this city. And it worked right. excellent in this city. Yes. I don't dispute that. I know you were part of the <laughs> reason why it worked. I, I guess what I'm saying is I'd love to see you move back into trying to get, get that re-established, re revitalized. I, I think it's important for all of us, for all of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Rezek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I don't have... Um I don't have any questions, but I do have a statement. I just want it known that I did get many contacts from constituents, whether it was emails or phone calls, to support this. Um, even though I, you know, agree with the, my agreed with my colleagues, I do. I was elected by my constituents, and I, and I have gotten numerous phone calls um, from different, you know, you know, different areas, different um, to support this. So I just want you to know that there's. People that follow the news, that read the newspapers, that watch these meetings have asked me to please support this. Thank you. Thank you. Move for a favorable recommendation. Second. Councilor Fowell, did you want to speak again? It's all right. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Sent to the city council unfavorably. Un uh, item number four. 
Order appropriation of 183,000 from the unappropriated estimated receipts ordinary revenue fiscal year 2017 to the police department personal services other than overtime to provide funding for two additional emergency telephone dispatches invited on roll mayor bill carpenter john acon and chief financial officer john crowley police chief Good evening, Councilor. Good evening, Mr. Uh, the um, the uh, explanation of this appropriation request that came from the clerk's office cut off a portion of it. The mayor's letter actually said to provide funding for two additional emergency telephone dispatchers to have language skills in Cape Verde and Creole, and to ensure that the hiring of additional police police patrolmen could continue on the the budgeted schedule. So basically, what that's trying to say is, when the council cut the ninety thousand dollars from the pub, uh, the salaries account. The mayor has hired the individual who that uh, money was attached to. Uh, the council doesn't cut positions, it cuts total amounts of money. And so this is a request to put that $90,000 back in so that we can try to get as many offices on uh, into the academy as we can. And the other piece is coming from a portion of that overtime cut and asking to hire two additional emergency telephone dispatch operators with language skills. We don't think we have enough of those. Councilor Barnes. Yes, thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Um, I did have a question. I know that uh, Council Rodriguez and I, we looked, when this originally came up a few weeks ago, we looked to see what the base, I guess, salary mm -hmm. is for the dispatchers. Um, and I actually had a conversation with the mayor today about that as well. Um, and he indicated it was around $65,000 for a starting dispatcher. Can you confirm or deny that? Well, the actual starting salary is just under $40,000. But the people receive a weekend differential and night differential, which adds to that. And then oftentimes, they get overtime. So the typical, in the last year, the typical payment to a dispatcher was about $65,000. OK. So and does that also uh, include their medical benefits and all of those things? No, that's or? additional. That's not in that money. Okay. So this $183,000 is only for base salary. It does not include? The no, it's just, it's, it's just for the money that's in the police budget, which is for the payment of the employee himself or herself. It's not for the health cost, which is in the personnel department budget. Okay, so this would cover, like you said, that differential, the overnight, nighttime, yes. um, or, or any kind of overtime that that any, person uh, might th incur. That's right. That's okay, right. and also um, the language proficiency, do they, is this covered in that? Do they get an additional, like a signing bonus or something for speaking of? I, I don't think there is one. Uh, there is an educational incentive, I think. Is there not? She left. she left. Yeah, I think there is an educational incentive in that in that a, uh, a language skill might re re uh, count for uh, for getting that educational incentive, but uh, there wouldn't be a signing bonus. Okay, this is great. A union position. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. you. Council Farwell. Mr. Condon, I'm going to take exception with you on something. I do not believe that the person hired at the police department occurred prior to June 13th when we voted on the budget. I believe that the person actually was hired and came on the payroll on July 1st. I think that's just, it just it was after the budget was adopted. I think that's oh, true. Right. So, and we had a pretty spirited debate here about this issue. And, and mm -hmm. Councilor Stadensky and I, who have about 36 years between us experience in police work, indicated that we thought that that position was, quite frankly, a waste of time. And I'm not going to go into the convoluted process that, we, that was used to hire the person. but. Now you want the $90,000 that the council cut right. because the mayor decided to go ahead and hire him anyway, well knowing the vote of this council. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell everyone else here, I have followed mayors and city councils since 1975, 41 years. And I have never run into an administration that basically says, in your face, city council, I really don't care what you think. I really don't care what you vote. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do what I want. And let me tell all of you how slick this move was. Instead of asking for money for mayor's staff and coming to us and saying, you know, I'd like to have someone in the mayor's office to oversee police community relations and public relations, he went to the union, he negotiated with the union to have them accept that position at that salary. And now every chief and every mayor that comes after this year is going to be stuck with that position. Because I'm quite sure the union has tenure rights. And I'm quite sure if you went to eliminate someone, particularly uh, uh, someone with tenure rights, you're going to get into a lengthy collective bargaining squabble litigation. 
And I gotta tell you, it's one of the slickest moves I've ever seen. At $90,000, we pay department heads here only about $1,400 more per year, and some of them been, have been here 38 years. Now, if we want to put our imprimatur on this and say, no problem, let the mayor do whatever he wants, and then when he spends the money where we told him not to spend it, and he comes back to us looking for more money, then you know what, we don't really have to be here. Let, let him do whatever he wants. Let him hire whomever he wants. Let him set the salary. Because clearly we're not going to be the guardians of taxpayer interest. And I, I think it's deplorable. There are very few issues that get me upset. But when somebody really insults your intelligence and basically says, again, in your face, I'm going to do what I want, that's unacceptable. And I am not going to vote for this. And I have questions for the chief as to how we arrived at the language for the uh, future people who are going to be hired as uh, dispatchers. My understanding is that they're in the union, and I think union members have a right to cross-bid into jobs. So you may not get anyone who is bilingual. You may get someone who wants to move from an SEIU position here over to dispatcher. There's no guarantee. And we have many different languages in this city. We have a large Lithua Lithuanian population. We have a large Greek population, Hispanic. So I'm not quite sure, unless we have statistics that bear out that we're getting call after call after call from Cape Verdean people who can't communicate, then I'm going to be a little suspect that we've got the data to back up what we want to do. And the other thing I will tell you is in the fire department, they handle 24,000 calls a year. We don't have anyone over there that speaks Cape Verdean as far as I know. And I would think that that department above anyone else would want to have someone who, spe who is bilingual. So if someone's having a heart attack, you could speak to them in their native language and tell someone how to perform CPR. So I will always respect however my counselors vote, but I am not going to support this. I think it's inexcusable. I don't like the way it was done, and I'm not going to be a part of it. Thank you. Councilor Farrell, you're invited to speak. Yep. Good evening. Council, let me take them in reverse order if you don't mind so I can keep them in my memory. We have 13 uh, ETDs, uh, telephone, emergency telephone dispatches that answer the phone at the uh, 911 calls to the police. Uh, as we were looking at the issue of languages spoken by patrol officers, uh, I asked the chief to report back to me on the uh, statistics of languages spoken by the people who first answer the telephone when someone is calling the police for help. Uh, and I, quite honestly, I was shocked to hear the results. So there are 13 telephone operators, two speak Spanish, two speak Haitian Creole, zero speak Cape Verdean Creole. So in a city that's roughly one third Cape Verdean, there's not one single city employee who answers the phone at the police department that speaks Cape Verdean Creole. Um, I do think that that is critically important. I listen to the scanner a lot and I can't tell you how many times a day I hear a call dispatched that in the dispatch the call says language barrier, language barrier, language barrier. And so not only are we maybe not sending the proper response to the person in need because we didn't understand completely what the need was, I think I would also make the case to you that we may be jeopardizing our own officer's safety by sending them running into a situation that they don't really know exactly what they're going into. And maybe this is the type of call that we would normally dispatch two or three officers to if we really had a clear understanding of what was going on. So I think it is an important public safety issue. Um, and I understand the union rules, um, but I do think it's important that we make this commitment. And, and you alluded to the fire department, and that, re that reminded me of an incident a few years ago, and I'm sure you probably remember it, on Green Street when two young children perished in a fire. 
because their grandfather, who spoke Cape Verdean Creole, could not explain to the firefighters that didn't understand him that there were still children inside the house because a couple minutes of information or a minute worth of information would be the difference between life and death. And I think you as a longtime police officer understand that the information is key. So I think that the, the, the demographics of the city have changed in the last 10 years. And I think that we've got to be responsive to those changes. And I think we have a, we have a duty and an obligation to protect all our residents equally. And I don't, know how we justify not having one single person who answers the phone. Now, you're right with the, um, in terms of the job posting, we can't require that the person applying for the job speak Cape Verdean Creole. Uh, what we've done with a number of positions already, and we would do with this one, is we can put language in the job posting that says ability to speak a second language preferred which does allow us to have the discretion that we've stated up front that there's a preference. What we're really seeking are people who do have the ability to speak a second language. I think it's a clear need. I think it's a very fair ask. Um, I think that, and we'll discuss my slick move to get a community relations person in, um, but I think that you could reduce the amount of this if you don't want to support uh, funding the uh, Director of Communications and Community Outreach, the Council does have the ability to adjust the amount of the appropriation to address this need. Uh, in terms of the okay, Director May I just ask sure. you a question on that yeah. particular issue? Yes. Do we have statistics that show that we have a significant problem with Cape Verdean people calling the police department and having the ability to report their whatever their issues are, as opposed to other languages that are spoken in the city. Because don't we pay for a, a translation service? Do we still do that? Don't, we, don't we pay to have a, 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 either a, some type of a telephone interpretation service if we need it, so that if someone calls whatever language they have? Well, if it's it, anything automatic like Google, I wouldn't want to rely on it because no, it doesn't No, no, I, I mean, I'm right. a vendor that we've selected, and don't okay. we? Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Here's what I, so I would love to have exact data for you. Up until very recently, we haven't had the ability to collect the data because technologically, I inherited a department that was 30 years behind the curve. I think that the council support for the crime analyst position in the budget uh, has been a very important addition for us. And one of the issues that I know that the chief has asked the crime analysts to work with the IT people on being able to track languages spoken by people reporting crimes, people arrested for crimes, people who are witnesses and victims of crime. So we are working, our new crime analyst who's only two weeks on the job uh, is working with the IT department as one of, that's going to be one of the first projects is to be able to collect that data. I would say to you, um, Councillor, that I don't think I need statistics to know that there are a lot of Cape Verdean people who live in the city. They're not all fluent in English. Some of them need to call the police for help, and we've got no one who works there that speaks the language. Well, and, so, and, let, and let me just mention to you, having worked on Commercial Street, if what you're saying is so critical, you would need at least one on every shift every day. Because two people Agreed. are barely going to cover it's the a number first step. of shifts that, that are in existence. It's a first step, Councilor. Agreed. It's a first step. I, I am not for a minute saying that let's hire these two people problem solved. Not, not at all. We have a lot of, we're a very diverse city that gets more diverse all the time. We have a lot of different communities here. And uh, I don't think for a second that hiring two people solves the challenges of language and emergency responses. Um, but I do think it's a very necessary first step in trying to address what to me is a clear need in terms of providing equal public safety. So I agree, this does not solve the issue, but I know that we're a lot better off with two than we are with zero, and it's a step in the right direction. The, the, and I think, I think we owe this commitment 
to the communities within the city that they feel as though that we are offering them equal protection as residents of the city. And I think there are communities in the city right now who don't feel as though they get equal protection. Well, it also seems interesting, having done budgets, that this came up after the budget was approved. I mean, if this was something that was being discussed among the command staff, the police chief in your office, why wouldn't it have been in the FY 2017 budget? Very simply, why? right. Go well, ahead. I'm glad you asked me because I had never asked the specific question about languages spoken by ETDs. The issue that we've been looking at is languages spoken by our police officers and working with HRD and civil service uh, to try to get a couple of um, special hiring lists so that we could selectively hire a couple officers that speak a couple of different languages. That's where the work and the effort has been going on. Uh, in the course of that conversation, recently, I asked the question of the chief, if we're addressing this issue among patrol officers, tell me about the people who answer the phone. Uh, it was brought up to me as a concern from one of the communities that we were not being responsive to this. Um, so had this issue been brought up a couple of months earlier, it would have been in the budget. And I think that um, in terms of the budget counselor, and I, I know we've got difference of agreement on a couple things. I'm still gonna go home thinking that you and I agree upon a lot more than we disagree upon. Um, but I will tell you that I made a concerted effort in that budget to address concerns that have been raised by this council over the last few months in a number of areas. And one of them was this issue of, of police overtime. It was clear to me that the council had expressed concerns about more oversight, more accountability around the issue of police overtime. And that was why I, when I submitted that budget, I submitted it with a $100,000 reduction in that line item from 1.1 million to 1 million. Because that was a gesture on my behalf to the council to say, I hear you. I don't for a minute think the million is really going to be enough money, but I'm listening to the concern, so I'm offering you a 10% cut on the line item so that, it, it, the, so that you would interpret it as a commitment from us to work with the council to try to keep that expense as low as possible without compromising public safety. And that was, that was the gesture that I made. And I think within a 10% reduction, we were gonna do the best we possibly could to try to make that number. Knowing that there was a good chance we'd be back in the spring explaining to you what we had done, what the numbers were, et cetera. I, I, you, know, you gave the numbers for um, the first quarter of last year, 412,000 or so spent in July, August, and September total of the, the, uh, the three yes, numbers that you including licensing right. and the mayor's initiative. Right. Mayor's initiative is our impact shifts. That's the impact shift money. Um, so uh, a, a process that was in place before I became mayor and used to get even more funding than it does now. Um, but the line item for overtime, 1.1 million to a million, 10% reduction. I made that as a gesture to the council to say, I'm listening to the concern. I want to work with you. To then take it down another 250,000 to 750,000, that 10% reduction went to a 30% reduction. And it's hitting right, at, they say, well, why are we coming back right now? Because it's hitting at the time of the year where I think the overtime really faces the strain. I'm not the CFO. I know 400,000 for the first quarter would average out to 1.6 million for the year. I don't know how the chief as a manager or myself as the, as the chief executive officer can just blindly spend at the rate of 1.6 million a year knowing that there's only 750,000 in the budget. So I hear what you're saying. I don't doubt the fact that you support public safety yeah, and let, let, you're willing to let us come back and ask for more. But a 30% gap is dramatic and so let me just, the rationale in asking for that 142, $350,000 reduction, 
We simply asked for you to put 142 back. That means that there is still a 200,000 or almost 20% reduction in place. And I felt, Council, that that still gives you that lever that you were looking for to make sure that questions that you had would be answered and that periodically you'd have the opportunity to have this conversation uh, with either the chief or myself or the CFO as to the rate of spending. But you know what that money is being spent on. That money is being spent on detectives' investigations and it's being spent on minimum staffing. And I don't think most people in this city realize that in a city of 100,000 people, on any given shift, we have either eight or 10 patrol officers protecting a city of 100,000 people. And we would not even have the eight or 10 if we don't spend overtime to get up to the minimum staffing to make sure we've got that many officers out on the street. And when I explain that to people, they're horrified. I think the average resident thinks we've got 25 or 30 cops out on patrol at any particular time. We're spending overtime money just to get to eight or 10, depending on which shift it is during the week. I don't see how we can cut that back any further, nor do I see how we pull the plug on long-term investigations by detectives that are yielding results in my mind, and we're, we're gonna have some tough days during the summer, but gun violence is down in the city this year so far, no matter what statistic you wanna look at. And I firmly believe the reason is that over this past year, we've had a number of successful long-term investigations that have gotten some real bad guys off the street. And by getting them off the street, with, with these investigations, we're targeting violent repeat offenders. It's not just willy-nilly anybody. We're targeting violent repeat offenders. We also have our Narcotics Bureau targeting dealers that we know are selling fentanyl because fentanyl is killing people every day. May I, may I sure. inject a minute? And, yeah. and uh, you know, you've, you've kind of drawn the line in the sand on this overtime. So let's have a full vetting of where some of it is being spent. Mm -hmm. First, you don't know how many officers are going to be injured on duty next year causing a vacancy. You don't know how many will be out on FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act. You don't know how many will have any number of reasons, a personal leave of absence because they've got a family issue. So unless there's a crystal ball, we don't know what our minimum staffing requirements are going to be. You'll see that you'll see it every week in the in the sense that you have people who are absent, but that seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars was sixty four thousand dollars a month. It was sixteen thousand dollars a week. You still had the impact shift and you still had the licensing. That is a considerable amount of money. But now, since you've mentioned the overtime, you have people that drive you around who incur overtime. I uh, No, I don't. You, you don't have I Officer have a, Smith drive you around? I have a personal protection detail at times in public when the chief and I agree that it's a situation that I should have someone with me. Well, with all due respect, going to Joe Angelo's, going to Sidelines, or whatever it's called, Tommy oh, Doyle's. Counselor. No, no, just a minute. Quiet down. Call the fire Quiet down. You shut up. I'll get this. I'm speaking. Call the fire department. You're getting shot at. Hey, Chief, the Chief Crowley, can you get an officer here? Two languages breaking here. How many of you can My point is, Mr. Chairman and so Mr. I'm, Mayor, I'm happy to respond. What, whatever money is being spent shouldn't be spent because if, in fact, you're in danger, you'd have to have somebody here at City Hall every day. What if somebody came in and wanted to harm you? Is, is, Mr., is Buck going to tackle them? Is Mr. Zimber going to arm wrestle them to the floor? So let's not be selective and say, when I go on vacation and I need to go to the airport, or when I come back from vacation and I need a ride from the airport, it's okay to spend taxpayers' money in overtime. That's what incenses the people out there, and they're the people who come to us. Right. And I'm sorry to bring it up, but you want to push the overtime issue, you've got to look where it's being spent. And you've got to ask, what's the return on investment? And there's no, well, so first of all, 
the protect right I I'm not going to recount here, but there have been numerous incidents where I was very fortunate to have a protection detail with me with incidents in public. And I go out on multiple events for the night. A typical night out for me when I'm out attending events, particularly on the weekend, is four or five or six different locations. And if I'm attending an event where people know in advance that I'm going to be there, uh, I think I am at risk and when alcohol is being served at the event I'm even more at risk because there have been many instances where someone who's had maybe one drink more than they should have has approached me in an improper way um, so I'm not going to apologize for having uh, protection with me at certain times it's not all the time I'm out around I'm out in public, I think, as much or more than any mayor ever has been. There is risk and exposure to that. Um, and, uh, and in terms of budgeting, the person who is with me, when he's with me, is not paid overtime. Uh, and it's a, it's a special detail, and you know what a special detail is, and that's not being accounted for in the overtime budget. It's, it's but paid in terms, for let me, by let, someone else? Let me, let me finish answering your question. So when you say, well, we don't know what this is going to be, we don't know how many IOD, we don't know how many are going to be out on any given shift, you're right. But as Councilor Sullivan alluded to earlier, we do know what historically was spent last year or the year before, and it gives us a pretty good expectation of about where it's going to go. And we also can factor in additional expenses like uh, a raise in a union contract that now makes the cost of uh, the personnel a little bit higher than it was, was the year before, and we can allow for that. So I'm simply giving you the comparison that if we spent 400000 in the first quarter last year on overtime, and the allotment is only 750000 for the year, it's irresponsible to just go spend the 400000 like you think you have it, uh, when you don't and so I think it's incumbent upon both the chief and myself to the extent that it can be done without jeopardizing public safety to Make management decisions. I think we have an obligation to make the money you allot us Last as long as possible and if this is the right way to do it Why don't we do it this way with any other city department? Uh, we're not doing this with DPW overtime with fire overtime uh, there are certainly a number of departments in the city that incur substantial overtime. And uh, I think that all of our department heads do a good job of monitoring it and trying to control it. As you said, a water pipe bursts in the middle of the night, you really can't plan for that, but you know you got to get everybody out there to get the service restored. We have a seven alarm fire. I'm sure a lot of firefighters were kept on extra time on overtime. You're right, there are going to be emergencies that you can't anticipate. But I think that you can look at the past couple years' experience and have a pretty good idea as to what a reasonable expectation is. And spending 400000 a 30% reduction, knowing that we spent 400000 in the first quarter last year, I felt it was a very reasonable request to come back to the council and say, I got it, you've reduced it 350000 but we've got a couple of critical months coming up right now in August and September, and we really need to put some of that cut back in order to make sure that we can keep the staffing levels at a, at a, at a safe rate. Because, Councillor, no one stops me on the street and says, you're spending too much money on police. It hasn't happened in two and a half years. It just doesn't happen. People stop every day, and express concerns for their safety, for crime, for drug use, for gun violence. And most of the folks I speak to would love to see us spending even more and trying to do more to increase public safety. And I've got to tell you, I think we have to have that conversation, have that conversation right away. Because I believe in light of what's happened uh, with the uh, targeting and murdering of police officers on duty that just as Boston has and many departments have across the country, we need to take a fast, hard look at how we're deploying our officers and, and uh, what changes could we make 
to improve and increase their safety. Boston's gone to double patrols on, on every car. They're not sending a car out without two officers in it. Now, I don't think that's probably feasible for Brockton. But what I do think is feasible is that at least for the near future, we should have two officers responding to a call and we shouldn't be sending one cop out by his or herself walking into situations that they don't know what they're walking into right now. But we don't have enough police officers on the street to dispatch to to every call. We're too busy. So my intention is, and this is, some of this is just from a meeting that Chief Crowley and I had today uh, in, in light of the most recent murders of police officers over the weekend. Um, I think we have a great responsibility uh, to provide for the public safety and the safety of the residents of this city. And at the end of the day, I don't think we can really put a price on it. I think you have a right to demand accountability to know that we're getting a fair return for what's being spent. Um, but I think we have an obligation to do that job. And I think we also have an equal responsibility to the families of our police officers to make sure they make it home at the end of their shift. And I think it's we need to allocate some money and start sending two cops out on uh, calls for at least 30 or 60 days and, and so we can continue to assess the situation. Because, Council, you more than anyone, you, you sat in my seat. Well, I, I and, was going to say... Let, and I'm let, sure that you felt the same sense of responsibility when you sat in that seat to look the families of your police officers and firefighters in the eyes and tell them you're going to do everything you can to get them home safely at the end of their shift. But, but here's my point. When I sat in your seat, I took the appropriation that was given for each city department, and then we managed it, and we exercised leadership skills, and we looked at where we could economize, where we could maybe do things differently and save money. And if we ran into trouble, we came back to the city council, and we made a full presentation, and we said, look, this is where we've spent the money. This is the results that we've obtained. This is what we think we've done for the citizens with, in each department. But now we need help. And the council responded affirmatively and gave it to us. I'm not suggesting that you and Chief Crowley take that 400000 or whatever it is that you think you need to spend for the summer and go ahead and replicate what you did last year. Rather, I would hope that you and Chief Crowley and his command staff would go back and say, look, here's the appropriation that we were given. Let's look at all options where we can get the maximum effective use of the money, the best results for the city, and then if we can justify it, come back and talk to the council and ask them for an appropriation. And what angers me is that you make a statement in the paper, well, I shouldn't have to be grilled in front of the city council. I would hope we well, I don't, don't think I said that word for it. Did you, re I, you know, I, I appreciate, that was, that I appreciate was, you saving my press clippings, well, that by was, the way. That was I, it, no, that was in the newspaper. I don't think I should come back and be grilled. Well, I hope we don't grill people here. I hope what we do is ask probative questions. We challenge people to do the best they can with limited financial resources, and then we help out when they need additional resources to make sure the citizens get the services they deserve. So please don't think I'm suggesting, and I don't think the rest of the council is suggesting, oh, please go ahead and spend exactly what you spent last year. Hopefully the crime analyst will help you. Hopefully the additional police officers on the street will help you. Hopefully the reduced crime rate and fewer court appearances will help you. And then if you run into trouble, as you did in January, we, we transferred money in January to police overtime. I don't think I know a person on this council that wouldn't do that. And I don't understand the objection to that. You did it last year. Well, first of all, last year we had an appropriation of 1.1 million, not yeah, 750,000. Yes, and secondly, I'm glad you brought up that point for clarification because I think that's been misrepresented a lot. You're right. We came back to the council. We didn't ask for additional money. We simply asked to transfer money from one payroll account to another because one account was running at a yep. little slower clip than anticipated. The other one was running at a little faster clip. And I think it's pretty logical to assume that the two were tied together, that if you don't have new employees on the job yet, your demand for overtime is gonna go a little faster. Um, what I'm saying is, a, a, and so what you're suggesting, you seem to be coming around to where we're at because that's exactly what we've done since the budget. We've sat down and looked and say, where do we find bodies without sacrificing all the other duties that, that we're trying to establish? 
community policing, school resource officers, housing authority officers, um, traffic enforcement. We're looking at all of these things and we've already started pulling people from those assignments and using them to cover shifts. But it's not optimum protection and, and there is a reduction in public safety when we do that. Now, we've stopped short of making any of those things permanent. The chief has had his shift commanders doing that on a shift by shift basis to try to do it very judiciously so that we still keep officers on those special duties as much as we can but before we're calling an officer in on overtime to uh, fill a shift for minimum staffing, that shift commander is looking to see, is there a traffic officer I can pull in for the shift? Is there a community officer I can pull in for the shift? Is there a housing officer I can pull in for the shift? We've already taken the two school resource officers and just put them back in patrol for the summer uh, because quite honestly, the schools are closed right now. And uh, we were able to cover their duties at Brockton after dark with community policing officers and get two officers back into patrol. We're taking all those steps, Councilor, and we're happy to come in periodically and review those steps with you. But when we look at that and we look at a $350,000 reduction, we say there's just no way to make that work without really making permanent cuts. And so we didn't come back and say, give us back that 350 uh, you reduced us last month. We came in and asked for 142 saying, we know this first three months of the year is a critical time. It's when officers are using their vacation time and their personal days. It's at a time in the warm weather months, as you well know, where crime typically spikes up and we need the presence on the streets more than ever. And that 142 still leaves us 70,000 below what we would have spent last year. So we aren't automatically going out to just spend the four. Mr. Mayor, 000. just let's keep on the order. Uh, we're on the 183 for the two, uh, two okay. uh, yeah. telephone op dispatches. Right. At this so let me just say I respect your point of view, but I still believe that the council did the right thing and that asking you to expend the overtime that you were given, show us where it was expended, show us the results that were obtained, and then coming back and asking for an amount of money in the future, I've never seen a council turn it down, and I don't believe it was an irresponsible thing to do. I think that's exactly what we're supposed to do, but I thank you for your comments. But I don't, and I don't, no, I don't council. remember the last time a council cut a police line item by 30%. Councilors, just a reminder, we are on item number four. Right. Two so, emergency telephone dispatches. My, my apologies, Mr. President. I didn't have an opportunity to speak on the previous question, so I, well set. I apologize for the council and council I Council Fowler, you all set? I'm all set for now. Uh, before we move on, I just want to remind the public, this is a public meeting. This is not a public hearing. You don't speak from the seats, and you are here as the guest of the City Council. Anyone has an outburst like that, they will be asked to leave, and they will not be allowed back in. Thank you for being our guest. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I actually just uh, I have a quick question for the mayor, and then I'm going to touch bases on... Uh, Make sure it's on number four now. It's on number four and a half. Hmm. I, don't, I don't want to We're be scolded on item by... on four at this point, Council. I don't want to be scolded by the Council President again. Well, yeah. We're um, drifting. And I do agree with what my uh, fellow Council down on the, on the left side said about the silk, you know, slickiness of, uh, of um, coming in front of us 18 days into the budget looking for this stuff. Um, well, it was in response to the cuts that were made, Council. I, I didn't anticipate, I I didn't anticipate the I cuts. I understand that. And speaking of the con uh, cuts, and I, I hope the uh, Chairman would just allow me five seconds of, because I didn't get a chance to speak on the other issue. You had a chance but, to speak but on because it. Of the, to. But because of the, what happened here a few seconds ago, I just brought something up. And uh, I know that the Mayor is protected for his safety, uh, but does this administration actually think that the safety of the Mayor an elected mayor is greater than the safety of elected councillors as well. Because we used to have a police officer in this room and we lost that police officer well, no, for you, reasons you, that I don't quite understand. Well, no. he's not here today. And I don't know why he's not here, but I did not, we did not reassign him for anything to do with budget cuts. So if he's not here, I would, I would assume that has to do with vacation time or something like that. Councilors, I'll check with the chief on that tomorrow in the city clerk. Yeah. I, I would appreciate as that. As a matter of fact, the, the concerns, uh, Council, I agree with you. We've, and, and also at Council of Farwell, 
we've had ongoing conversations with the chief trying to figure out how we could work into the budget some sort of police presence here at City Hall because we do deal with a lot of difficult. I mean, Council, you, you worked in the mayor's office for four years. You know, you, you, you can get some threatening people at that counter, and it's not just in the mayor's office. It's at the tax bill office, and it's at the assessor's office, and, um, I, and, and we get folks coming in off the street that are dealing with mental health issues and, and substance abuse. So um, I'm, I, I think we should have some sort of a police presence here at City Hall during the day, and absolutely here at the meetings. That's why I supported having Officer Healy here for the meetings. Mr. Chairman, just a point of order, and, and I'm, I'm only gonna mention this only because I know when the last time when we met, the officer had mentioned, I think he is involved with the Brockton After Dark program, and that's why he would not be here during our summer months because he's at that particular program, but I believe, and I'm only taking words to what he said, that he would be reassigned back in the fall, that I think he was asked through you, Mayor, I believe, and through the police department that he'd be a part of that program to work with the kids during Thank the summer. Thank you, months. Councilor. Councilor, I will talk to the police right. chief in the morning to make sure there's somebody assigned to the restaurant right. meetings. Right. The rest of the time, we are talking about... So I'm moving on to number four. ...receipts number four. towards two emergency telephone dispatches. If anybody wants to get home on the same day they came <laughs> here, let's talk oh. about that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I, I just want to address uh, something that the councillor, my uh, at-large city councillor said in terms of uh, the fire department of not having a dispatcher. Uh, two wrongs don't make a right, councillor. And um, being a resident of the city and uh, knowing the population of the city the way I, I do know it, uh, to be honest with you, it's embarrassing that the city does not have um, the ability to answer 911 calls. We're not asking. I know we have a tendency of getting carried away in the sense this isn't the welfare office, this isn't, we're not giving any benefits out to anybody, this is merely answering calls from citizens looking for help. So the fact that this community, when you're looking at the largest ethnic group in this city, we all say it, the high school says it, the community knows it, we all know it, when you don't have the ability, my parents don't have the ability of picking up the phone, American citizens, but we all know that in case of emergency, you, you tend to revert back to your native language. And if you don't have the ability to communicate that, shame on us for not doing that. Uh, I do understand what you're saying as far as the slickiness of trying to put two things together to kind of make it one. But I, I, don't, under, I don't understand how this body would actually kind of refuse the opportunity, the opportunity. We have Spanish speaking. Uh, 911 operators, we have Haitian speaking 911 operators, but yet your largest ethnic group does not have the ability to call the police department and say somebody's breaking into my home or somebody's doing something into my house. So that alone, it goes to show that some of us sometimes are a little out of touch with the reality of things in this community. Now I am going to support the measures of hiring the two 911 operators because there's an opportunity there. I've complained about this for the longest time that I can remember. I think I've said it to the mayor, I've said it to the police chief, I said it to the former police chief sitting to your left that this community does not respond very well to calls when it comes to, we complain about the, the fact that the immigrant communities are not approaching the police, are not providing information, but yet we don't do a great deal of a job in terms of asking those folks to provide us with that information. So I just want to leave it out here that I'm actually in support of at least hiring the two uh, telephone operators. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to be done and that's something that we can carry out a conversation after the fact because if it's just bringing in two additional individuals and not taking care of the issue that we're looking at, it makes absolutely no sense. But there's absolutely no reason why we should not have both in the fire and the police department. Uh, responders that actually can respond to the needs of this community. So I hope that my colleagues will uh, in reality support this so we can move forward. I understand that we have other languages, but it makes absolutely no sense when one third of the public, the kids in your public school department are Cape Verdean speaking, that we don't have a single Cape Verdean operator in the, in the police department. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilor Beauregard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a statement. Uh, this is extremely disheartening because it makes the council look right now like we're not pro-public safety when that is not, in fact, the case. 
And now we're being asked for uh, Cape Verdean Creole speaking uh, operators, uh, dispatchers. And again, we would not be opposed to this service because certainly we should not be denying a large sector of the population an opportunity to seek the services they so rightly deserve. But in the same token, it seems that we're not getting all the specifics. We're not getting all the information that we should receive in a timely fashion so that we could evaluate this and again inform the public so they themselves would be made aware of everything. One of our largest challenges in this community, regardless of the language, regardless of the age, is the misinformation that this community receives on an, a regular basis through many forms, and this is where the frustrations and anger grow, and the dis delusion, disillusion, and um, continued frustration, and we're trying to make a better community here. We're, through safety, through economic development, and through many other uh, levels, and departments and situations, and it just seems that let's turn this around and start having the specifics we need given to us, and, and this is by no means directed at uh, the individuals in the auditor's office, but uh, through these uh, various departments when we need the information to provide the community properly, because like, like Councilor Azak, I received some uh, questions and frustrations from constituents. And again, this is because we only get pieces and we don't get the, all the information we need to make the right decisions for our citizens. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think it's refreshing. I mean, you have passion. Obviously, the council has passion. I think uh, at the end of the day, a couple points, and then I'm going to uh, hopefully uh, talk my colleagues into making an amendment on this, but um, if, okay. if the 90,000 plus position was so important and the budget is generated in conjunction with the CFO, I don't know why you didn't just call individually the counselors to articulate why you thought it was so important prior to us ratifying the budget. You're the mayor, you're the CEO of the city of Brockton, but there is supposed to be a collaboration so approach. Can I respond to that one yes. before we go on to the rest? So. Uh, I, I did make it a point, Council, when I presented the budget to, in my opening remarks to the Council, to uh, mention and explain the three or four new positions that I was proposing to the Council in the budget. And brief, because obviously there was an opening statement, it wasn't a night long thing, but I gave brief explanations why I felt that each of them were critical needs. I said we're adding a handful of critical positions, including this one. That was at my opening remarks on Monday night. I had no inkling or clue that any counselors had any questions or concerns or reservations about that position because from Monday night to Wednesday night, I didn't get any feedback from any counselors in terms of saying, wait a minute, uh, one of those positions you're putting in the budget, we've got a little question on. The budget cuts are done, at the, it's the very final piece of business. So I, I never had the opportunity to come back in front of the council a second time. So maybe we can think about in future budgets a way to have a specific conversation around specific cuts parliamentary wise. But um, I, with whatever they were, three or four new positions, I thought I had laid them out with, with explanations as to why I thought they were important. I made it a point to highlight those in presenting the budget so there was no effort to hide or bury or conceal anything in the budget. I was kind of highlighting to the council up front what some of the uh, appropriations were that I was asking for in that budget. And uh, in retrospect, hindsight's 2020, um, had I had a better pulse, had my finger on the pulse of the council better, to realize that there was concerns about that position, I certainly would have done a better job of it. And, and I, I applaud you on that. I, but I think at the end of the day why, at least I could speak for myself, and I was here and I, I agree with you that you articulated that at the opening, but I didn't know as a counselor at large that the ball was already in motion that there had already been negotiations with unions and the like. And, and that's, I mean, that's your purview, you're, you're, you're the mayor. But I think, I think those are important information pieces. Now, now, 
what was discussed by you is that we could we could dissect this because I do have a problem that the ninety thousand dollar position is wrapped into this. I also concur with Councillor Lodge uh, Rodriguez. I think this is vital. Um, I also think some strong consideration should be given um, to the thirteen operators that are already there, maybe for bilingual training. I think that's money well spent on that endeavor as well. Um, but if we're talking about the police and nine one 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 dispatchers, and you talked about that tragedy a few years ago on Green Street, then that's just common sense that should carry over to the fire department as well. Um, but what, what I'd like to hear tonight, Mr. Mayor, is, is if we make a cut on this, or we amend this by, say, 93 grand, if you're talking 45 and 45, that's 90,000 out of the 183. A few years ago, and this wasn't the current chief, uh, uh, the previous chief before you, Chief Crowley, uh, came before this council and made a representation to us promised us that if we did a certain act that a certain uh, position would be reinstated. And that was a falsehood. That never happened. And we can sugarcoat it all we want. That, that didn't happen. What was stated didn't, was not accurate. And you could agree with me on that or not agree with me on that. But what, what I'd like to say tonight that is if, if we dissect this and we you know, earmark or make an amendment, you can't earmark, we make an amendment relative to those two positions. I want to make sure that that funds that's appropriated is used for those two positions. That the, the right. 45 and 45 is not then put in hiatus and used to compensate yeah. the community. It's more than, I think it's more like 65 and 65 and then maybe prorated slightly for a 10 month period or something this year. Um, the, but that 65 and 65, I mean, that if, if the position is already- We didn't back into the, in other words, we. we we're not necessarily looking to recover the entire 90, just like we didn't look to recover the entire overtime. Um, I think I think 130 prorated for 10 months or something like that. I mean, you guys can do the math. Um, I think you do have the ability to uh, adjust the number. If you want me to make a commitment, uh, Counselor, that if we appropriate 110, 120, 130, whatever you guys decide the correct number is to fund those two positions, that those positions will be added. I have no problem making that commitment right now. I, I'm the one that brought this initiative, this request to you, asking you to, to, to fund it. Um, the chief in my meetings with him feels that there's a need for the two additional positions, irregardless of addressing the language issue. Um, we have one ETD, at least one out that right now that I'm aware of. And I think that uh, when I asked for some budget numbers when we're doing the budget, we're paying a pretty, a fairly significant amount of overtime in that budget that some of that overtime expense would be offset by the salaries of a couple more uh, ETDs on there. So I, I have, uh, it, whatever the number the council determines uh, is a fair representation of the cost. I would ask you to use the 65 as an annual cost because that's really what they make. The 45 is a base salary before you start adding all the other stuff in. And uh, even with two more, I know they are going to still be earning overtime. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And point of information through you, Chair, um, my colleague uh, just gave me this. So the starting salary for ETD is 38411 However, this does not include the night differential, which is 11.3% April 1st through November 30th, and 21.3% for December 1st through March 30th. Weekend differential, which is $4 per hour in educational incentive. As an FYI, the average salary for the county of 2015 was 65300 which again, doesn't include overtime. So I think right. if we looked at a 65000 we, we, we took the safe. average Councilor, trying to it's give the council a fair representation of what the true cost was. I, I, I also, uh, I also um, would hope that we would have perhaps better communication um, between the mayor's office and the city council. Um, I, I don't know if, if anybody else on, on this uh, esteemed body has been called recently uh, and, and getting some complaints from constituents, but I sure have. Um, and now, I, I do applaud uh, your chief of staff calling us um, for Tent City, but the Tent City actions have already mm -hmm. begun. Yeah. Um, but there are some, some communications, I believe, and I don't know if the, Mr. President can concur with us, but I think we need to have a better dialogue um, because, again, we need a collaborative approach. Um, so with that being said, uh, Council, I, I agree with you, and I would ask the Council to make the same effort well, with me I, What also. I can say, Mr. Mayor, I'll just give you some examples. When the President of Cape Verde comes here to the City of Brockton, and I, as a Councilor at Large for 11 years, wasn't aware of it until I read it on Facebook, mm. 
I think there's something wrong there. Um, so just a minute, Counselor. I found out about that the day before. I had well, with that being said, Mr. May, you found out, out about it. The day before. It, so so well, we're, we're off point. Event. I am going to yeah. make a motion, though, um, in, in the form of, of a, uh, an amendment to this. I was disappointed chair. with the short notice myself, Counselor. Thank you. Counselor has the floor. I'm going to make a motion to amend um, the appropriation. Um, it's right now appropriation is $183,000. I want to slash that or uh, reduce that by $63,000. I'm sorry, $53,000, correct that. $53,000 to come in uh, at two positions at $65,000 each. Second. So the motion is made to 45, slash the appropriation by, by 53 dollars to $130,000 from Correct. unappropriated estimated With the receipt. caveat, Mr. Chair, that the mayor has articulated and made a promise to us that those funds, if appropriate, would be used specifically for those two positions and nothing else whatsoever. Right, that's not part of the order, though, Councilor. No, but so that's you know. my desire. Yep, I understand. The motion has been made and seconded to uh, strike $53,000 from this to make this an appropriation of $130,000 from unappropriated estimated receipts, ordinary revenue, fiscal year 2017 to Police Department personal services other than overtime. All those, all those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed? The amendment carries. Now, with that being said, Mr. Chair, I want to make a favorable recommendation back to the full council as amended. Second. 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 Motion made and seconded to recommend back to this full city council as amended. All those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, amendment, the no, order Mr. carries. Chair. Yeah. Item number five. Order appropriation of 60000 from unappropriated estimated receipts, ordinary revenue, fiscal year 2017, to the Board of Health Personal Mr. Services Cassari. other than overtime to provide funding Jim for a vacant Cassari. position of sanitary inspector currently unfunded in the fiscal 2017 budget, invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Luis Italia, Executive Director of Health. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Councilors, uh, fortunately, we had cuts to the budget, which were not just from the police department account, <laughs> and uh, from some of the other budget cuts, we're looking to reappropriate some money. This is from the Treasurer's short-term debt, which we decided we didn't need. And in this case, we're asking to restore a position which was uh, left unfunded because it was not filled two budgets ago. And uh, when we put the budget in front of you, it was balanced as submitted. We've now got some additional revenues. What we're proposing to do is to put funding to that position, which has been unfilled for a while, but it's an existing position, simply not funded. And this would provide an additional sanitary inspector. It would provide for additional sanitary inspections, especially with respect to the uh, execution of the um, certificates of occupancy. You raised the fees on that a while back, and so we think over the course of the year, this position would actually pretty much pay for itself with the additional generation of revenue and additional inspections, and it would be good for the safety of the housing stock in this city. So we'd ask you to approve it. Thank you. Councilor Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Condon, so I'm looking at the, um, the makeup of the office from the budget book of this year. So there are six, the, currently there are six sanitary inspectors, and this is the seventh one that was just open and unfunded and yes. vacant. So um, would this be uh, some kind of in-house promotion, or is there going to be a, an all-out um, search for folks, or how's I this think, I don't think there's anybody on the layoff list. Oh, Lou does Mr. Tataglia know around. how that's going to work? Yep. Come on, why don't you step up? I don't think you've got anybody in the layoff. They should be hiring on this job, I think. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Hello, sir. Councilor, we have uh, four sanitary inspectors, one for each quadrant of the city, plus we have one uh, strictly for, mostly for uh, restaurants. So we have five sanitary inspectors and an open position, which has been open for two years. Okay, it says there are six here. in the most recent submitted hierarchy of your department. Six, and then this would be the seventh. Let me take a look at it, Council. Come here. Yeah, I can see that. One, two, three. Wow. Well, 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 can I see that for a Council, if you could return to your seat so that the uh, oh, wow. public can hear you. Five. I don't know. Oh, five, six. Okay, okay, I see it. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Councillor, can you get back to your seat so the public can hear you? So would that be in-house promotion or? According to the uh, contract of the inspectors, we would have to post it in-house first. Post in-house first, okay. Yes. And um, when would that go into effect? When would that start or when would you start looking for? Um, as soon as it's approved. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Tagli. Appreciate it. Mr. Sullivan. Uh, good evening, Mr. Tagli. I just had a question since we just talked about uh, positions with bilingual and the makeup of the city of Brockton now. Would this, uh, this posting uh, be preferential for bilingual candidates for this position? Maybe after in-house. It could be. But um, it has to go to in-house um, as part of the contract. Okay. I just, I think, I, I think it's important to, to, I mean, if public safety needs that, those that run businesses that, and it's not their primary language, I think needs that as well. So thank you with that being said. Uh, Councillor, if it's, if it's filled from an in-house promotion, then the idea would be to backfill on the vacancy and at some point you'd probably have a vacant position where you'd attempt to add a uh, language preference for skills on the, a second language. Because that position, Mr. Connor, would be still left funded with maybe a dollar. Yeah, there'd, place be, yes, there'd be well, somebody already getting paid who's getting paying, doing a different right, job. Right, there'd be an elevation up. Something get pushed up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anybody else? Let's say a motion. Move for a favorable recommendation. Second. 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 Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably to the full city council. Thank you, councils. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Segler. Mr. Chairman? Council Fowell. I never asked, but could we take 24 out of order? This is, as my understanding, Mr. Kasseri's first day back at work, he had quite an injury and an Actually, illness. Mr. Kasseri has left and we, that was, <coughs> that should actually be tabled. We're gonna be able to, all of the people hit in that order don't need to be. Okay. It's gonna be tabled. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I don't like that. Item number six. Order appropriation of 12,000 from unappropriated estimated receipts ordinary revenue fiscal year 2017 to the traffic commission ordinary maintenance services <coughs> to provide funding for the consulting engineering studies of several intersections. This was requested by the commission in its budget request, but not funded in the mayor's budget. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Captain Robert DeBarry, Traffic Commission. Okay, Councilors, this is also being funded from the budget cuts. Uh, at the time the budget was prepared, there was a request that came in subsequent to the departmental budgets coming into my office, and the paperwork just didn't get shuffled properly. We'd have put this in the budget originally, we didn't, we didn't, and it should be funded. It's in Mr. Chairman, I make favorable recommendations back to the council. Second. Motion made to second and recommend favorably, favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Recommended favorably. Item number seven. <coughs> Order appropriation of 18,000 from unappropriated estimated receipts ordinary revenue fiscal year 2017 to the Council on Aging Personal Services other than overtime to provide funding for an additional part-time staff position in fiscal year 2017. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Janice Fitzgerald, Director of Council on Aging. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Again, funded from the budget cuts. Uh, during the budget discussions, uh, Janice Fitzgerald indicated she needed more additional additional staff help. I think she'd prefer a full time. The request came in at part time, at, at least at least thinking, let's let's get started on it by put the money in uh, to give her some. Move for that. favorable recommendation. Second, Second. Second. on the. Uh, excuse me. Before the motion, there are some councilors who have questions. So, before the motion is entertained, uh, uh, Councillor uh, Rodriguez. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to actually hear from uh, Ms. Fitzgerald. And then I have a couple questions for her, if I could. Good evening, Ms. Fitzgerald. Good evening, councillors. How are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, if I can just take a second and just um, introduce the... Uh, actually, before you introduce, this would be a good point for me to mention to the public that the Council on Aging's favorite uh, aging councillor, Council <laughs> Monaghan, had some surgery today and isn't here, and we all, uh, he's at home watching. I'm sure you've all, been, I'm sure you've all received some texts that I couldn't repeat on TV. So <laughs> send out wishes to Councilor Monaghan. And now if you would introduce your, your group. Thank you very much. Um, so I always take an opportunity to keep bringing this up and mentioning it over and over again because this is an important issue. 
Tonight, my board of directors have um, chosen to be here tonight. My staff, volunteers, some concerned seniors, and actually everyone else that I didn't mention, perhaps you have a Brockton senior or you're a Brockton senior yourself. So this issue concerns just about everybody in this room. Um, in perfect timing, the enterprise, if you noticed on the front page, and I had absolutely nothing to do with this, <laughs> the region prepares for an aging population, and I ask you these two questions. Are we prepared? No. Yeah. Is enough being done to meet the needs of the growing number of seniors in the community? No. I cannot continue to provide the services that my staff and I are providing at the level that we're providing them. We're being asked to coordinate more support services for the growing elder population. By 2020, the um, projected increase is about 20%. Presently, we have over 16,000 elders in Brockton. We have as a membership over 6,000 at the COA. So if you do quick math, that's probably about a third of the elder population. We're working to expand the COA because we just can no longer provide um, the services and the activities that we provide. Um, and I have to tell you, the other day I was kind of taken aback and as I'm listening to some of the folks that spoke before, before me, um, about duties and obligations, it was suggested or mentioned to me that we need to be careful of what we put out there that we provide for our seniors. And I was totally taken back by that. And I said, shame on the city of Brockton for not being prepared to take care of our senior population. So with that being said, I'm begging, begging, begging for bodies. I'll take a part-timer if that's all I can guess, get. Quite honestly, I wanted a full-time, but I figured a part-timer was, was easier to get. Um, my voice is cracking, not because I'm crying, but because I have a cold. So as I'm listening to myself, I'm like, don't think I'm crying. Um, but seriously, I need help. I'm begging, please give me a body. Councilor Rodriguez. Um, Janice, uh, Ms. Vescero, let me ask you something. Where are you going to find a qualified person at $18,000 a year to do anything for you? I'm not going to. And what would a full-time position cost the city? Um, based on the most recent union um, contracts, we're looking at 34000 34000 So we're looking at... $16,000 more? Very good. Yes. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I know that we as the council cannot uh, propose increases in budgets. We can only cut. Uh, so if my colleagues actually uh, have some questions at the end, I'd like to make a motion, because I know there's a motion. Was that motion second, Mr. Chairman? I did not. We haven't accepted the motion yet. Okay. What I would like to do is, uh, is make a motion to postpone this until possibly uh, our next financial council meeting. So it's my hope that Ms. Fitzgerald and the mayor and the CFO can get together and come back in front of us asking for the other $16,000 so we can turn this position into a full-time position to provide a better service to the seniors in this community. Just to Follow remind up. you uh, before we accept your motion and take a second that uh, we are on summer schedule. It would mean that it would be September before well, it would be before somebody be hired. So just a recommendation to you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to see it done right versus just to do it in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in, in a rush in the sense because I think we need to find somebody that's you know, innovative, has the energy to actually help the folks in the Council of Aging get their jobs done. That's so fine. I, think I just it, want to remind of the summer schedule. That's I'm all. Sure, I'm sure, Ms. Fischel. Would you have a problem with that? No. No? Okay. So I'll... I'll, 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 I'll Open the floor up to my counselors and then I'll Any other questions before we act? 
So, uh, Councilor Barnes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, Th and thank you for all that you do for our aging population. I have um, several loved ones and family members that participate in the services that you provide, and um, I enjoy being there uh, as well when I'm able to come. Uh, you mentioned something about, you know, that rang true, uh, Brockton not really being prepared for the aging aged population. And one thing that actually um, I was just made aware of that I had no idea about, and this is what, what, what makes me very concerned, and I, I support uh, Councilor Rodriguez's uh, motion to uh, postpone it until you can get some more funding to be able to get someone, is there is an increase in the state of Massachusetts for um, elderly people becoming addicted to their prescriptions. And I was not aware of that. And that's something that, that takes a very special skill set to be able to, to assist and to advocate and to manage um, those, those kinds of situations with our, our loved ones, grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, whomever. Um, and for us to not be in a position to provide enough services or you know, at least a monicum of services for, for that particular issue um, gives me great concern. And um, there was something else I was going to actually mention. Um, there's a member. Yes. Oh, yeah. Of course, she's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that a senior she, moment? She's getting better. Yeah, I know. Oh, my God. Can I join? <laughs> it's my turn. Um, but I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, the public understands, you know, kind of what the seniors go through. We're not there yet. We've, we're kind of detached, and we don't really kind of understand. But um, the issues that affect us as, you know, baby, baby boomers or middle age or whoever, whoever we are, um, they're also affecting our seniors, and, and they're often pushed to the side. So I thank you and your staff for the tireless work that you all put in um, to the, the folks that utilize the center and the outreach that goes on, too. So thank you. Yeah, and the outreach department um, is new to the COA. And I have to tell you, Dottie, and we just hired another part-time outreach, um, Frank, they are doing amazing things. We are able, with Dottie's position, to do some more educational, health education. We just had a, a presentation on opioid abuse for elders. We do a lot of the drug take-back programs um, in conjunction with the mayor's office. Um, so we realize the needs of our baby boomers are a lot different than what was years ago. Right. We realize that. In order for us to continue to provide the services, we need the bodies. So, councillors, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, the motion has been made to postpone to the next finance meeting. Is there a second? Second. 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 On the motion. On could, the motion, Councillor Sullivan. And quick question for you, relative to uh, and I and I want to applaud Mr. Rodriguez. I think that's a brilliant idea. We talked about this many times. Uh, we filed the resolve, and Janice was here just a few months ago. The 17 grand differential, I mean, that's, that's definitely within the realm of the inappropriate estimate receipts, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, we had we been um, requested specifically for the additional half position. I'm sure we would have funded it at the time the request was made. Okay. This was submitted at the end of June and we're now into July. I don't think the mayor or I dispute the need over there, so we'd figure out a way. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to postpone until the next finance meeting. All those in favor? All those opposed, postpone until the next finance committee meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Charles. Item number eight. Order appropriation of 50,000 from unappropriated estimated receipts ordinary revenue fiscal year 2017 to the DPW engineering personal services other than overtime 37,000 and DPW maintenance personal services other than overtime 13,000 to provide additional funding for the newly hired city engineer and to correct a calculation error on the salary chart for the maintenance division. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Larry Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Okay, Councilors, this also is coming from the budget cuts. There are a couple of different things going on here. The last two were, as you know, there were contracts settled as we were putting the budget together, and my office made a couple of calculation errors. So the seventeen, uh, the thirteen thousand, and the thirty-seven thousand dollars have to do with budget calculation errors that need to be fixed. The fifty thousand dollars we had an appropriation in the budget for a half year of the city engineer. Subsequent to our putting the budget in front of you, but before um, the end of the year when this budget uh, supplemental was requested, uh, we thought we were going to hire somebody and we needed the full year, so we're asking for the $50,000. 
after they made the offer to this individual, you got a better offer from another community, and so he turned us down. So now we don't need the $50,000 because that person isn't hired. We're still doing a search. Uh, it might be helpful, though, to get some portion of that because we're finding it's difficult to um, recruit at the present salary. And so that's a, that sure. might be worthwhile to at least give us some portion of that 50. So the 37 and the 13, which is 50, is needed, and perhaps half of the 50. So a $75,000 would be... Uh, so you would recommend a cut of $25,000 from this appropriation? I would, right. Yes. We'll get there when somebody wants to make a motion. Any questions? I'd entertain a motion to re reduce the appropriation by $25,000. Chairman, I'll make a motion. Uh, the appropriation of 50000 decrease it, reduce it by 25000 for a reduced amended amount of 25000 appropriation request. Form Second. Motion. Second. So the motions were made, the appropriation of I, Mr. Condon, 50 to 25, is that right? Yes. Motion was made and seconded to cut the uh, appropriation from $50,000 to $25,000. All those in favor? All those opposed? The amendment carries. Mr. Chairman, I make a favorable recommendation as uh, amended. Second. 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 Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council $25,000 from unappropriated estimated receipts to DPW engineering and maintenance. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Council. Item number nine. Order appropriation of seventy-five thousand from the unappropriated estimated receipts ordinary revenue fiscal year two thousand seventeen to the DPW Water Commission Water Enterprise Fund desalination charges to provide additional funding for up to fifteen days of purchase of desalinated water during the summer at the full contractual amount. The funds will allow the city to exercise a sustained full test of the system. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Mr. Uh, Condon. Uh, Councilors, this is not from the water revenues. This is also from the budget cuts to the general fund. What we're asking for is some money so that we can buy additional water over the summer months uh, from Aquaria to fully exercise their contractual obligation of 3.81 million gallons a day. Uh, that's not a sufficient amount of money in the budget at present to do it. We started buying 3.81 million sometime mid-June last month. Uh, that was out of last fiscal year's budget. We'd like to keep doing it to at least do it for 30 days consecutively to see that we can uh, have them produce. That's the request. Council Farwell. Uh, just a question from Mr. Rowley. Uh, I understand they can do 3.81, but they're supposed to be at 0.7 above that. Can they do it? Well, Council, I have the deliveries here. Um, good evening, everybody. Good evening, um, Mr. Rowley. There are some days there are 3.8 and 3.9, and there's one day here almost at 4. So can they do the 4.2 that they're supposed to? Sustained. They're close. Sustained. Can they do the 4.2? It, it's close. Well, I, I don't. I, I we. I, I don't know. We haven't okay. asked it's, for that. It, but I'm saying with the flows that came, they st we started flowing water in the Brockton June 18th, and they've been consistent with their flows up and down. But they they did produce in one day four million gallons. So, can they reach that 4.2? I'm going to say yes. Okay. And then the last question, because if I don't ask, I'll never know. If they're under a contractual agreement to meet a certain target for production of gallons per day, why do we have to pay them to prove they can do it? Right. Why wouldn't they have to do it on their own? Well, we, we have to buy it first. We, we, I mean, so I mean we, we, we have to put the request in to buy the water. So we can't go to them and say, you're supposed to be at 3.81, show us you can do that. We have to pay them for the extra water? Yes. Well, yeah, we have to pay for the water, yes. Yes. You know, it's, it, that just seems odd to me. It would be like buying a car from Mr. Ian Erie and then I've got to pay him to prove that it runs. I mean, they, they, they are producing the water, Councillor. They are producing. I, okay. But this is going to be over and above whatever they've proven to you now. We're going to purchase extra water just to verify that they're meeting the provisions of the contract. Correct. All right. I'm in the wrong business. You want to say that, Councilor? Yes. <laughs> Councilor Azak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I just have a quick question for Mr. Condon. Mr. Condon, the order states um, 15 days, but you said 30. So which one is it? Well, there were 15 days that they were taking water from Aquaria at the end of the last fiscal year, at the very end of June. 
that, that appropriation is gone because we're in a new fiscal year. So the 15 days in the beginning of July takes care of uh, some additional time. Okay. So, and Council, the, the, uh, the uh, contract provision you are referring to is it's called excess water. It's a half million above their fixed commitment, and not 0.7. Uh, so that's where Larry's coming up with a 4.2 or 4.3. But whatever water we take them from them is purchased water. You know, there's two pieces to that contract. One piece is that so-called fixed commitment payment, which reserves a portion of their capacity to our exclusive use. Whether we use it or not, it's there for us. But then if we actually want them to produce water, we pay for that at a reduced <coughs> rate. I think it's about $1.30 per thousand gallons, and that's what this pays for. What, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, and we'll save it for another night, but the reason I ask is that I attended the Water Commission meeting recently, and I was flatly told they can't meet the target. And I had quite a discourse with them about mm -hmm. why does the city of Brockton have to meet all of its obligations under a contract, but then the vendor seems to slide and Ca well, you know, Council, we're close. Uh, I'm going to, Councilor Razak has the floor, so oh, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you, uh, right. you'll be getting another chance to talk yep. if you need to. I'm fine. Mr. Okay. Uh, Condon finished the question, answer, so. Right. So. Do you want me to answer this, the, the second question? Uh, we'll get back to that. Okay. You all set, Councilor? Thank you very much. Councilor Sullivan. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Condon, you, you know, I, I'm not a friend of Aquaria, and, right. and Aquaria hasn't been a friend of this, this body for, for years. Mm. Um, but with that being said, um, when the individuals finally appeared last year, um, they had the ability to try to bring a financial fine against the city of Brockton for breach relative to uh, late payments. And at that time, I asked individuals if they would waive that, and they said yes, they would in good faith. Have we contemplated asking them if they would waive this additional purchase amount to see if they could actually uh, prove it? To go above the 3.8? Yeah. Uh, that is at a reduced price. It's a, I think it's like 62 or 63 cents per thousand gallons. We haven't asked for that. The concern that exists on that production hasn't to do with the plant, but it has to do with the amount of pressure uh, that would have to be pushed through the pipe the as it goes across the railroad crossings. And they've had a hard time getting permission from the T to test it. And that's what the concern is about that, as, as I understand that. I wasn't at the meeting you were at, uh, you were at, Councillor, so I don't... I don't know specifically what was said, but they did waive that penalty provision last year. We haven't asked them to produce the extra half million and do it without charge. We haven't asked them. Is that we something could, that we, we would contemplate? Uh, we, we had, I hadn't thought about it. We could ask them. Okay. Yeah, we could ask if them. If you could, and then just report back to what they, yes. they tell us. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Okay. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Barnes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rowley, could I ask you a question, if you don't mind? As you approach, just to, uh, to hurry the... Hearing on, um, you have the report there about uh, some of the draws that we've received uh, so far and the numbers. And now that, you, that this has kind of come up and there's a question about their, uh, well, there continues to be a question about their ability to fulfill their minimal contractual agreement. Um, is there a way we can maybe get uh, a running a copy or get that report as this 15-day trial series goes on just so that we can see also where they're hitting and if they're hitting their mark um, and if not and, and just kind of be in the loop? Absolutely. Is that okay? That's something yes. we can get? Yes. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Rodriguez. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Raleigh, uh, don't go anywhere. Yeah. Just don't go far. Don't go too mm. far. Um, you know, um, and I agree with Council Sullivan, you know, we've been going at this uh, with Aquaria for quite some times now. Um, we've got uh, a population in this community that actually have voiced it very loudly, you know, with what they see as a waste of six and a half million dollars that we pay just for the right to purchase water from Aquaria, because that's what that fee is for. Um, why, and, and there's a, there's some serious concerns within the population of their inability to provide what they say that they can provide. Why not basically have them do a 30 straight days worth of production? Because I know uh, Mr. Condon said they did something in June, but we are now on July 18th, so I'm not exactly sure if that's still going on. But why not amend this order so that it's 30 days worth of, I mean, even if you have to ask for $150,000 or whatever the asking is, to at least send a, a, a message to the community, that, look, I know we're wasting you know, these millions and millions of dollars, but at least we are able to ask these people to produce 30 straight days of 
three, you know, three and a half, four million gallons or whatever the, the asking is, but at least to do it on a consistent basis. So why not go for the full 30 instead of just the 15? Well, we have, Councilor. We, we, we started delivery from desal into Brockton, um, 618, and we're still taking water now. At, at, and they've met their goal. They've met the contractual right of 3.8. Every day since the 18th. Every, they, they had a minor breakdown for two days. Um, other than that, they started right up again. Because we had this last year, and we had the breakdown of basically what they did in a, per in a period of 30 days. I, I, and there I, were some I, gaps in the middle of four or five days where they produced absolutely nothing. So that's what I'm just saying. I, I, Even have, in the, the language, I have the flow chart right here, and I can, I can send it to all of you. They did have a breakdown for two days, but they ramped right back up. And we've been, so yeah, I could say we got 28 days of, of 3.8. They are meeting their contractual obligation. We haven't asked for the other water yet. I'm saying there were some days that they were up almost at 4 million. Can they get to the 4.2? I don't know. I think they can, but I'm not sure. That's the excess water that we can call for for June, July, and August. It's in the con contract. Well, what I'm saying is that you've got an order here saying that up to 15 days. It, that, that's so why not amend this order to 30 days so that at least we can kind of you know, keep our population at ease that these folks are actually able to do this on a consistent basis. And, and that's all I'm asking. Yeah, no, we, you know, to I'm agreeing with you. I, the, the, more, the more we can, more water we can take from diesel and the less we can take out of Silver Lake is, is better for everybody. Would you, would you have a problem if I postpone this? Um, I think there's a little breakdown in communication. Well, it says 15 days. I don't know what the Correct, communication is. Correct, because the first, they are drawing 30 consecutive days. 15 days were in June, so that was the last fiscal year that was funded out of last year's budget. And the request here tonight is for the second 15 days for the total of 30. So this is basically to pay, our, to pay them for what they already did. Well, if, if they started in June 18th, and we're talking about July 18th, and now it, there's a month. Right, it's 20, how many days? Yeah, let me, I'm gonna get out of the way. Council, there's a budget together right now for the variable purchase. We need some of that to be left over because we may need it. We may have a break. There be maybe at some point during the fiscal year where you need to draw on that. The money that was, the water they, they produced for us that we asked for in June will be paid for out of the appropriation that was through June 30th. That money is paid for. What we're looking to do is get additional money in this year's budget so we can continue to take that and not exhaust the fiscal 17 appropriation which is in the budget so that we've got it there for another reason if something comes up during the course of the fiscal year. So that's how we're getting 30 days consecutive. But if you but deny you this. You understand our, our issue here because it basically states, you know, hey, we're asking for $75,000 so we can basically it buys 15 come days up with it. It buys 15 days worth of water. Council, just point of information. The other 15 days was already paid for in last year's budget. Yes. The so it is a 30-day draw, correct? Yes. And if you don't yes. give us that money, there is money in the budget to pay for the 15 days that we're talking about in July and keep going. However, you'll exhaust the fiscal 17 appropriation and leave us with nothing. So we're asking for a supplemental to make sure that doesn't happen and we'll continue to exercise the system. While we're doing it, we're having a mini drought and you're not taking water out of Silver Lake to the extent that we're taking it out of Aquaria. So it's benefiting Silver Lake as well. But last year we took 15 days or 12 days, whatever it was, Larry, I don't have the production figures. It was paid for. We, we determined the start date on the basis of what was left in the fiscal 16 budget and we bought it. Now we're in fiscal 17. We have a budget appropriation, which is sufficient to pay for a bunch of days, I don't know, remember off the top of my head, of purchases during fiscal 17. We're looking for 15 days on top of what's already budgeted. That's why it's described that way, and it gives us the ability to continue to run this test so that we find out that they can do 37, 38, 39 on a continuous basis. That, that's, that, that was confusingly presented, but that's what we're trying to do. Okay. So, Mr. Riley, can, can you actually give us the, the, uh, the breakdown that the Council Barnes asked for? Yes. So we can yes, kind of see that? Yes. And is there any way you can put this on the, web, on the city's website so that the, the, the citizens can actually see this as well? I don't see why not. I mean, it's public information, yes. 
You know, you because that's that. one of the issues that we have. I mean, people, we, we run on the regular basis. I mean, we hear on the regular basis that Aquaria cannot produce the water, but yet if yeah. they're producing the water, we're not being fair to them either. So if you could actually do that, I think it would, uh, okay. it would kind of help us all out. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Move for favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Motion made and second to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommend it favorably. Item number 10. Order transfer from ambulance receipts 10,000 to the fire department ordinary maintenance services telephone 10,000. These funds will be used to pay for the monthly payment of air cards for use in laptops and tablets for all apparatus and ambulances for the period of July 1, 2016 to June 30, 2017. These air cards allow for a constant flow of information between fire alarm and the responding apparatus and ambulances during dispatch and while on scene at accidents. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Williams, Fire Chief. Good evening, Chief. And on behalf of the entire council, I just want to commend your, your department. I know that was quite a fire uh, this past weekend. It was. Thank Glad you Glad that uh, there was only one minor injury, and thank you and your men. Thank you. Good evening. Recommendation? Questions? Move for a favorable recommendation. Second, Mr. Stanisky. Can you tell us what it is? Uh, motion is made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Council. Item number 11. Order that the city council approves the first addendum to the November 10, 2014 intermunicipal agreement with the town of Abington and authorizes the mayor to execute any and all documents to evacuate the same. Invited on row Mayor Bill Carpenter, John Econ and Chief Financial Officer, Larry Raleigh, DPW Commissioner, Philip Nazrella, Solicitor, John F. Stone, Superintendent, Sewer Department, Christopher Petrini, Special Counsel to town of Abington. Good evening, uh, Solicitor Federoff. Thank you for being here. Good evening. Uh, I believe this is Councilor Fowler to file us. I did. Oh, Councilor Burns. I did. Um, this was a, a while ago when, um, in 2014, and I actually spoke with Mr. Stone also <clears> today <throat> just to get a refresher. And I've been in communication with Councilor Lally because this is also in his area. Um, it's to, from what I understand, it's to um, extend the timetable that we have to request of the DEP to um, make some uh, authority decisions with regarding uh, dumping or, or not dumping, but acquisition and um, per, uh, okay, maybe you should just explain it. It's late. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you. There was essentially in the IMA that you all approved, there was a timing component which had to do with the new NIPTES permit, which is issued by the DEP. That has yet to be issued. There's a slight delay. So this just extends the time period for which we can iron that out with the, with the town of Abington. It actually doesn't alter anything. Instead, um, if we weren't able to meet the time deadline, we would have to get back with that town and renegotiate some sort of settlement figure. So it's actually a cost avoidance to do the extension. Any other questions, councilors? Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Attorney. What, what, what's the basis for the delay? So essentially, um, there's been a, quite a shift in the DEP, and and many of the NIPTES permits are delayed, including some of our, um, you know neighbors, Taunton, Fall River, New Bedford, and we're all delayed. It has to do with a dissolved oxygen standard, which is an issue for the EPA, and we're working with the, the DEP to ensure that the science behind um, the standards that apply to us are appropriate because they're a bit out of date. So essentially, there just has to be some research done. So in terms of the, the amendment, uh, once it's ratified, what, what's the expectation of a time to, to meet that? When, what are they giving you a guesstimate of? It's tough to say. Um, DEP has indicated that our permit may issue in the next couple of months, but there may be an extension beyond that due to a new study that is, that's expected to take place. So I can't say for certain, to be frank. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Recommendation? Oh, motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you. <laughs> Item number 12. Mr. Chairman, I'd Council like to move we take 12, 13, and 14 collectively, and then I have a motion regarding those. Second. 
Mo motion made and seconded to take items number 12, 13, and 14 collectively. All those in favor? Opposed? Take them collectively. Uh, Madam Clerk, please read items 12, 13, and 14. Order that pursuant to the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, the City Council authorizes the establishment of the Animal Control Revolving Fund not to exceed 5,000, the K-9 Unit Revolving Fund um, not to exceed $5,000, and the, sorry, uh, closed cases for uh, not to expend more than 35,000 in the fiscal year, 17, Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, and Chief Financial Officer, John Crowley, Police Chief. Mr. Chairman. Council Fowell. I'd like to move that these be indefinitely postponed. The reason for that is that under Chapter 44, Section 53, E and a half, you have to submit and have the revolving funds approved before July 1st. There is only one exception to that, and that's if a new funding source comes into the city, in which case you may then establish a revolving fund, and that information comes from Attorney James Crowley, Legal Counsel, Division of Local Services, Bureau of Municipal Finance. I had an extensive conversation with him. Well, here a second. Second. Motion made and seconded to, I'm sorry, the motion was to? Indefinitely postpone. Uh, you cannot indefinitely postpone. You can either table or you can postpone to a date certain. I would recommend postponing till the next finance meeting in that time. I have an answer for that. Uh, okay. I, I know that the attorney with the Department of Revenue has a point of view, but he's not a judge, and we have a different point of view, counselor. In that statute, you cited one section which allows uh, if you haven't established one and a new source of revenue comes up, you can establish it at the start of the fiscal year. There's another section which reads, in any fiscal year, the limit on the amount that may be spent from a revolving fund may be increased with the approval of the city council and mayor in a city. There's a restriction on that, but it has nothing to do with the point we're talking about. It talks about the aggregate amount of the fund. We've long taken the position that with the respect of one of these revolving funds, if there was an error in getting it in front of the council before June 30, that going from zero to the funds is the same thing as saying we're, we're increasing the limit. If you choose to postpone these or not to approve them, it's not a huge, a huge issue of consequence, but I don't agree with Attorney Crowley's uh, position on that matter. I don't agree. A motion has been made and seconded. On the motion. On the motion, Councilor Barnes. Thank you. Uh, no, you said that it won't have a huge detriment, but what are the consequences, though, if we don't reestablish these now? Well, there is a few thousand dollars in each of these accounts. I'll mm -hmm. give you how much there is, and they would simply close out uh, to uh, the f free cash calculation. They wouldn't be available for the purposes that we're looking to establish them. Um, $6,000 in the spade animals ca account. Mm hmm The 5000 for K-9 and 35 for closed case? $466 in the, oh. uh, in, the, in the other animal control one. Oh, that's and the, the closed now. cases is $1,479.60. So the amount of money is not, not consequential. I'm, I'm just sorry, disputing, what was the number? I'm disputing the position that Attorney Crowley uh, has just taken. What was the number in 14 in the closed cases? Uh, $1,479.60. Motion made and seconded to uh, postpone to the next finance meeting. Uh, on the motion. On the motion, Council. I'd Sullivan. like to. Uh, I'd like to get our legislative council attorney Gilday uh, to give us an opinion relative to this because I too was under the belief that it needed to be done by a certain date um, in my uh, my prior uh, municipal law experience. So if we could do that, tie it into Councilor's uh, motion, yeah, I think I would that'd assume be appropriate. We'll, we'll reach out to uh, Council. I would ask. Councilor Federoff, uh, Attorney Federoff, but I wouldn't ask her to give us an opinion tonight. I don't think she'd be able to do that, so. But I'd, uh, I'd actually like it from our lawyer. Our counsel. So the motion has been made and seconded to postpone till the uh, August FinCom. All those in favor? All those opposed? Postpone till August. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you can make sure to uh, uh, send notice to uh, Attorney Gilday to make sure we get a ruling. We'll talk to him too. Item number 15. Order that the City Council authorizes the acceptance and expenditure of the total grant award in the amount of 
$1,276,000 from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Mass Works Program to the City of Brockton Planning Department Mass Works Program Grant Fund to fund roadway reconstruction and st streetscape improvements along Center Street. There is no match required. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, and Robert May, Director of Planning. Mr. May, why don't you step up? Good evening, Councillors. Um, we are here uh, asking for permission to accept a grant from uh, the Mass Works Project, which funds infrastructure projects from municipalities across the Commonwealth. Uh, we have uh, a little over a million dollars have been awarded to us to rebuild center. Um, as you know, uh, when, when Trinity went in on, on their side, they rebuilt the streetscape. The, however, the street itself is in, in bad shape, and, and uh, we have to remove uh, some existing trolley tracks to rebuild the road, and then we want to uh, streetscape the southern side of center, which is uh, along the WB Mason. And, and you've, if you've seen Masons, they've done a lot of work on their um, uh, facade. Uh, this would also rebuild the intersection at um, center and Montello uh, with a new um, traffic intersection, uh, new um, uh, equipment so that it would be able to communicate with uh, the other street uh, traffic signals as we rebuild them throughout downtown. Council Beauregard. Hello, Mr. Chair. This is, happens to be in Ward 5, and I, I signed on to this because any way that we can begin to get certainly better traffic uh, signals in this community, we're all for. That is an extremely active uh, intersection all day and or into the evening and also any kind of road repair that we can have with no matching funds certainly is something that I recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion made on the motion, Councilor Barnes. Just uh, one more thing, Mr. May. So um, in the walking tours that we've taken of, of the area, um, yes, looking at the street lights and the timing and all of those things, will this also take into account some of those uh, recommendations, like widening the street and, or narrowing the street, excuse me? Um, yes, ma'am. It'll take into the uh, entire complete streets philosophy, which okay. is a mass dot uh, initiative to make walking and biking safer for everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommend favorably. Thank you, Mr. May. Don't go far. Item number 16. Order. The city council authorizes the acceptance and expenditure of the total grant award in the amount of 30000 from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Community Compact Program to the City of Brockton Planning Department Community Compact Program Fund in order to plan the first step in securing funding from the Massachusetts School Building Authority for Critical Building and Rehab rehabilitation project invited honorable mayor bill carpenter john a Conan, chief financial officer and robert may director of planning good evening mr may good evening councillors um the city has uh, entered into the community compact program with uh, the commonwealth and uh, we've identified a couple of different uh, funding opportunities the um uh the need to analyze and prioritize and rebuild our um, public schools is, is critical. Um, having a, uh, a building assessment is, and plan is the first step to securing additional funds from the state that will allow us to uh, um, make those improvements uh, where necessary. This item is also connected, I should say, with item number 18, which is on the next page. That, uh, uh, Mr. Condon will uh, share more information with you. But uh, we put this project out uh, in an RFP. Uh, we had four um, uh, respondents. Uh, the winning, um, our prospective winning uh, team is uh, Arrow Street. And um, they've done some, a lot of work like this in other communities. And so this fund, uh, the Commonwealth Compact, would match the um, uh, funds that Mr. Condon is looking for. Uh, and allow us to move projects forward here in Brockton. Thank you. Questions? Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Uh, Mr. Cruz. Um, Mr. May, is there a match for that 30 grand or no? There's not a match to the 30 grand. The 30 grand is a match to the, the, the city's um, request on uh, item 18. 18. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Farwell. Just want to recognize the school committee members that turned out in support of this. I think it speaks well of the committee. They're a part of uh, 
Bottom here for another issue, here. and I was going to introduce all of them. <laughs> but they're here. Why don't you introduce them? Give them a wave. Uh, well, I see uh, the vice chair, Tom Minicello. Uh, uh, yeah, Mark looked, uh, D'Agostino. Brett Gormley and uh, Mr. Sullivan and it must be my eyesight. Stand up. Uh, Stand up. Mr. Sullivan here too. Thank you, man. I was not going to forget you. I was going to talk about you on the issue you're here for. So, <laughs> any other questions on this? Chairman, make a favorable recommendation back to full council. Tagging. Tagging. Prior to that, Councilor Rajak. Quick question, Mr. May. Um, so the thirty thousand is just for the plan to, to draw up the pl plan. The thirty thousand is a portion of the larger plan. Uh, we were able to um, uh, segregate some funds from the Commonwealth to to augment uh, the work that we're doing. So it would be just added on to. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Motion been made and seconded uh, to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. All those opposed? Recommended favorably. Item number 17. Order, the City Council authorizes the acceptance and expenditure of the total grant award in the amount of 40,000 from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Division of Municipal Services Grant to the City of Brockton Department of Public Works Division of Municipal Services Grant Fund for the inventorying horizontal infrastructure through the purchase of the GIS hardware and support of field work. There is an in-kind match of $4,012 for this grant. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Johnny Conant, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Good evening, Mr. Rowley. Good evening, Councilors. Um, we received this grant money of 40000 to GPS a lot of uh, sewer manholes that are in the woods and the easements, um, which then become converted to the GIS, GIS hardware, which is iPads, so it's easier, easier for us to locate them. We have a recommendation back to full Second. council. Second. Excuse me, on the motion, I'm sorry, Mr. Rowley. What's the in-kind? Council Barnes. Oh, thank you, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, the in-kind is, is, is in-house work, the labor that we've done to GPS all these locations to go through the woods. I see. I'm sorry, I should have explained that. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank that you, was, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommend it favorably to full city council. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Item number 18. Order a loan order of 900000 is appropriated to pay costs of developing a municipal and schools facilities master plan, including the payment of all costs incidental and related hereto, and that to meet the, this appropriation, the city, with the approval of the mayor, is authorized to borrow said amount under the pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 7, Clause 21, and Section 7, Clause 22 of the General Laws, or pursuant to any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes of the city, therefore. Further order that the city treasurer is authorized to file an application with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Municipal Finance Oversight Board to qualify under Chapter 44A of the general laws any and all bonds or notes of the city authorized by this vote and to provide such information and execute such documents as the Municipal Finance Oversight Board of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts may require. The CFO certification is a conditional certification provided that the city will appropriate its present unused tax levy capacity, which currently exceeds $3 million, to pay the annual debt services cost when it comes due. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Martin Brophy, Treasurer, Tax Collector, Kathleen Smith, J.D., Superintendent of Schools, and Aldo Petronio, Chief Budget Officer, School Department. Uh, Councils, I'll just speak briefly on the financing piece and then the components of the 900000 There are people here can speak on. Basically, under the Mass General Laws, if you want to borrow from the, uh, or take advantage of the Mass School Building Authority grant program while you're borrowing, you needed to have done a facilities plan. This would pay for the facilities plan. In addition, if you uh, borrow the money for a study, consultant study to do a facilities plan and you attach it to a construction loan, the amount of the planning money can be added to that loan and paid back over the life of the construction loan. If you don't do a construction loan, then you've got five years to pay back the planning money. So the cost of this, if there's no construction, would be at max a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. If you do a construction program, it depends upon what we decide to go and you'll have to decide as a counselor how much you will or will not approve in terms of new construction. Councilor Farwell. 
How did we arrive at 900,000, Mr. Kahn? And is that, is that, did we do the RFP and yes. that's what we got back? And yes, it's with a contingency on top of that, yes. Okay, now my only other worry is, because I know your certifications, particularly your conditional certifications well, you're saying that we should not do this unless we're willing to go to the full two and a half levy. What, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, you're asking under that certification, do I anticipate that there's going to be any impact on the continuous provision of the existing level of municipal services? And what I'm saying is, I don't know, but I will give you a certification which is unconditional if you're willing to say, when the debt service comes due, we'll use the levy capacity, which isn't being used right now. It's not an override question. It's over $3 million to pay for the debt service. I told you it's only a couple hundred thousand a year if you pay for the planning study itself. So I'm not saying don't do it unless you're willing to. I'm simply saying the only way I can be sure it won't affect services is if you're willing to do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions on the study itself? Uh, and, and again, I want to thank School Committeeman Minocello, D'Agostino, Gormley, and Sullivan. And if there's anybody hiding behind a pole, anybody else up back there? I want to thank you for being here Superintendent Mike tonight. Thomas is here as well. Deputy Superintendent Mike Thomas, he is hiding behind the pole then for me, so. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I actually have a question for uh, Mr. Thomas. Council Burns. Mr. Good evening. Good evening, Thank Mr. Tom Thomas. Thank you for staying and being patient no, um, not, for this. Not a problem. So um, the administration, you, you all have taken us around on the bus tour. We've, <laughs> we've seen, you know, the schools and their conditions and um, also seen some of the patch up work that your department and that the, the school department is trying to make and keeping our kids safe. So um, does this, would this encompass all of the schools or the most uh, dilapidated schools, or how, how is this going to be configured, the, the actual um, report? It would be all the schools. I mean, obviously, they'd spend a lot less time on the Baker School and the George School, which are, you know, only three to four years old. Uh, they would spend a lot of time on your older schools, obviously, Brockton High School. Um, a big part of this would focus on Brockton High School, and um, I have um, spent a lot of time with the MSBA over the last five years uh, with the support of the school committee and, and this body, the city council. Um, we have brought $50 million to the city uh, with 20% that you approved to fix now 12 of our schools right. with windows, boilers, roofs, and right. that's you know kept these schools open and running well. Uh, but now this facility's master plan goes beyond just windows, boilers, and, and roofs. It, it's going to talk about do we need a new school on the south side? What do we do with a high school that's 42 years old? Um, that needs a major renovation because, as you know, I think after the Newton North issue when they built a school that was about $500 million, they're not going to mm -hmm. build you a new Broughton High, which would probably cost about $800 million to build a school that size. Plus, they have nowhere to put the students while they're building a new school like they did in West Bridgewater and East Bridgewater. So you would look at almost like a three to four, five-year renovation project for the high school to be renovated and maybe adding a stem wing so these are the kind of things that this facility master plan would look at they'd probably also spend a lot of time on the four old junior highs um would have obviously were built in the early 50s um, so they would spend a lot of time even though those have new roofs and windows and boilers you're, you're looking at the interior what needs to be done you also look at upgrading uh the capacity of those schools what you could do with technology there because right. as you know they're now that they're moving towards online testing, a lot of work has to be done to the infrastructure of these schools to accommodate that online testing. Okay. And how long do you um, anticipate this whole process from draft to possible implementation? I want to say, did they, was it 18 months? 18 months uh, study? 12 months. 12 months. 12 months. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Mr. Thomas. Thank, thank you, you Councilor. President Cruz. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I had a question. I'm not sure if it's for the mayor or for... The order calls for developing a municipal in schools master facilities plan. Are the municipal buildings part of this, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, certainly not as many, but. Uh, <clears throat> no, a absolutely, Mr. President. Uh, and that was, uh, this is really a, a joint effort to look at both schools and city buildings. Uh, the expansion, potential expansion of the Council on Aging is part of this, looking at our fire stations, police station. I mean, we, we know this, this is a study that's long overdue, um, and 
the first step in any responsible long-term capital planning is to really assess exactly where you're at, what your future needs are, and, and setting a, putting a plan in motion. So certainly this is of primary importance to the school department uh, because, as Mr. Thomas mentioned, in, uh, in order to apply for any future MSBA funding, they're requiring a, a facilities master plan be done. Uh, but as Rob May worked with the uh, school department on this, it was clear that we needed a citywide facilities master plan. So, you know, certainly the the police station and the fire stations and the library and all of these buildings will all be part of the study. Okay, I mean, because it was mentioned, but then we didn't hear anything about that. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Because we're certainly we're lucky actually that we haven't had some public safety unions sue us for the condition of some of the police and fire stations, so. No, there's no question, and as you know, Mr. President, we did get some money in the budget this year to address uh, some fire station roofs. It was a small first step, and, and there's no question uh, that we've got uh, significant issues with a lot of city buildings, and that'll all be uh, studied as part of this master facilities master plan. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilors, any other questions? Councilor Neary. Move for favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Motion made properly, second favorable recommendation. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to full council. Thank you. Madam Clerk, item number 19. Order, loan order of 6.6 .6 million is appropriated to pay cost designing and constructing sewer mains and related appurtenances, including the payment of all costs incidental and related here to and that to meet this appropriation, the city, with the approval of the mayor, is authorized to borrow said amount under the pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 7, Clause 1, and or S Section 8, Clause 15, or pursuant to any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes of the city, therefore. Any borrowing pursuant to this order may be undertaken through the facilities of the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust, the trust into the end. Any appropriate official off the city is authorized to enter into one or more loan and security agreements with the trust and one or more project regulatory agreements with the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, as may be required in connection in, with any financing through the trust. Further order that the city treasurer is authorized to file an application with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Municipal Finance Oversight Board to qualify under Chapter 44A of the general laws and any and all bonds and notes of the city authorized by this vote and to provide such information and to execute such documents as the Municipal Finance Oversight Board of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts may require. The CFO certification is a conditional certification provided that the City Council be willing to periodically increase rates so that the Sewer Enterprise Fund remains fully self-sufficient. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Martin Brophy, Treasurer, Tax Collector, Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Okay, okay Councilors, I, I'll take a crack at the uh, financial aspects and the certification piece, and uh, I can tell you that the work that's being anticipated here, if you approve it, and Larry Rowley can uh, reiter reiterate on this, this is very important work regarding an interceptor that comes out of the west side of the city and comes under Route 24, but he can talk to you about that. With respect to the financing, it's basically a borrowing. It allows us to borrow the money either through a normal source or through this Water Pollution Abatement Trust, which is a Commonwealth of Massachusetts opportunity for municipalities to save money on interest costs by using that trust. We've done most of our sewer and water borrowing in the last 15 years through that trust, so we'll make that application. In addition, if we're not successful there, it allows us to go through a, a channel called the uh, Qualified Bond Act. That was the last part of it where the city could probably get a lower rate by using that because the state guarantees that the bond payments would be made out of our state aid if the state doesn't, if the city doesn't pay and defaults on the loan. So that's what the technical aspect of it is. $6.6 .6 million we'd be borrowing for either 20 or 30 years depending on the particulars. So the annual cost, if we get an interest subsidy as we probably will through the trust, wouldn't be close to $500,000. We don't need a rate increase at the moment. The sewer fund is self-sufficient, but you're talking about a 20-year borrowing. So my certification says, as you go on the road 20 years, you're gonna to have to raise rates periodically to make certain that you, know, you can't have the same rates 20 years from now you've got today. Costs are going to go up. You've got to be willing to raise the rates as those costs go up to pay for this work. And that's, uh, that's the financial part. I'll take questions on that unless there are questions for Larry. Councilors? Any questions for Mr. Rowley on the interceptor? 
Kelsey I have Rodriguez. one for Mr. Riley if I could. Mr. Riley, based, based on the recent developments, I mean, we've had water mains breaks all over the city um, from the winter on, months, I mean, Main Street, we know what, we know what the story is. Why the sewer and not the water? Well, well, we will be coming in front of you about the water. But I'm saying, but why Actually. not that? I mean, I'm looking at it, uh, it's what's more of an urgent matter. Actually, Council, the water is important, but the work we have to do here is very complex because we're going to have to go under Route 24. What, what it is now, it's one of our trunk lines that comes from the northwest side of Brockton and captures all of Oak Street, Good Samaritan Hospital. It's too small and it's surcharging. It's an eight inch, we're gonna increase it to 21. To, to do that, it's a lot of open and open cut work and it's very deep. And when we have to go under um, Route 24, we're gonna to have to jack a pipe under it. We can't, we just can't open a trench up on Route 24. Um, and then we put a pipe in a pipe and then the pipe that's there, we're gonna to try to line that so we have some redundancy. So from that point across the highway, we're gonna go down Keene Street into Pleasant Street and then we go into Gary's Farm, if everyone knows where that is, and that gets the interceptor. So that is very, to answer your question, water is clean water, sewer water is, we don't need any problems with that. Well, I, I, I don't want to get in, I don't want to get into the details. Uh, we, we just, we don't want that spilling all over the street and filling people's cellars up with raw I storage. I understand that, but. So to me, that's, that's very important. But my, my concern was that, I mean, when you're doing the sewer in those particular areas, are you going to do the water as well? If, if, if need be, yes. But right now, Pleasant Street's brand new water main on Pleasant Street. We just did that probably three or four years ago. Um, and we'll look into Keene Street. But where, where, need, where it needs, you are actually going to do something in, in terms of replacing the water as well? Absolutely. Okay. Especially when we're digging that deep, if we have to replace the water, we'll do it at that point in time. And when do you foresee, I know that's not in the order here, but when do you foresee some of the work uh, being done for the water mains, in the, uh, especially on Main Street? Um, on where? On Main Street. Pleasant. Main Street's all done. We did that. You mean up near North Main Street? Exactly. That's all done, Councilor. How far We've, did you come? I mean, we did from Ames to Vine, where it kept blowing out. I know, but what I'm saying is that if that's, that's the old pipes blowing up I mean chances are the the ones but south of that are pretty old as well we, too, aren't they? we're in the we're in the in the progress now of um, process of reevaluating our water mains coming up from Silver Lake so it does take time to do a survey and engineer this we will be coming in front of you with that shortly thank you mr. chairman thank you thank you mr. Ryan. Favorable recommendation back to the full again. council. Again. Again. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably. Item number 20. Order. A loan order of $1.1 million is appropriated to pay cost designing and making sewer flow metering improvements, including the payment of all costs incidental and related thereto, and that meet this appropriation, the city, with the approval of the mayor, is authorized to borrow said amount under the pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 7, Clause 1, and or Section 8, Clause 15, or pursuant to any other enabling authority and to issue bonds and notes of the city, therefore. Any borrowing pursuant to this order may be undertaken through the facilities of the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust, the trust, and to that end, any appropriate official off the, off the city is authorized to enter into one or more loan and security agreements with the trust in one or more project regulatory agreements with the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection as may be required in connection with any financing through the trust. Further ordered that the city treasurer is authorized to file an application with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Municipal Finance Oversight Board to qualify under Chapter 44A of the general laws and any and all bonds or notes of the city authorized by this vote and to provide such information and execute such documents as the Municipal Finance Oversight Board of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts may require. The CFO certification is a conditional certification provided that the City Council is willing to periodically increase rates so that the Sewer Enterprise Fund remains fully self-sufficient. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Martin Brophy, Treasurer, Tax Collector, and Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Well, Council, is this is similar to the last one. The borrowing term would be a little bit less because it's for metering flow meters, but the purpose of this is for essentially an assessment of the entire city's uh, collection system to see where 
the work that uh, we did a great deal of work in the last decade, but we need to continue to do it. The state wants us to do it, and you need to make sure you're staying up to speed on it. The one section that we're talking about coming from the west side, that 6.6 .6 million one, we know we've got to do. This is to examine where else we may need to do work on the sewer system for the city, and the financial explanation I gave on the last order pertains to this one, too. Councilors? Favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably to the full <laughs> city council. Thank you, councilors. Thank you, Mr. Conn. And item number 21. Order. Loan order of $4 million is appropriated to pay costs of making energy efficiency improvements to the city street lighting system, including associated design and engineering services, the converse conversion of standard lighting devices to LED devices, fixture upgrades, and payment of of all other costs incidental and related thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, the city, with the approval of the mayor, is authorized to borrow said amount under pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 7, Clause 3B, or pursuant to any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes of the city, therefore. Further order that the city treasurer is authorized to file an application with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Municipal Finance Oversight Board to qualify under Chapter 44A of the general laws any and all bonds or notes of the city authorized by this vote and to provide such information and execute such documents as the Municipal Finance Oversight Board of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts may require. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Martin Brophy, Treasurer, Tax Collector, Lawrence Raleigh, DPW Commissioner. All right, Councils, this has been in the works for a while. Uh, the city has a procurement for the work that's been done. The price is already known. Uh, there's a little bit of a contingency in here. It's basically for replacing all the lights in the city with these LED lights, not just the street lights, but uh, parks and recreation lights, school facilities lights. Uh, it will pay for itself. There's also a grant that we're going to, we already know we're going to qualify for it, but we've got to complete the work first. So we won't be borrowing $4 million. We'll really only be borrowing about $3.1 million. It'll save about a half a million dollars a year in energy costs, and within a few years it will pay for itself, and then the savings will be ongoing. So this is a, this is a good project, and I hope you approve it. Councilor Rezac. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer this question, uh, Mr. Condon or Mr. Rowley. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. Rowley. I know last time you were before us, uh, we talked a little bit about the LED lights, and I had asked if, um, you know, where we, they were already installed. And I think you mentioned City Hall and the the um, little bridges down off of... Yeah, no, City Hall Plaza. City Hall and Plaza. And Main Street from White Ave to Pleasant Street. So from White Those Ave to Pleasant? Those are all LEDs. Okay. Excuse me? From White Ave to Pleasant Street? Yes, okay. yes. Just, I have constituents that have asked, they want just to see the difference. So that's, is that all that we've done so far is? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Uh, Mr. Conner, I just had a couple quick questions for this. Um, as you know, we, um, this, this body and, and I kind of uh, ran with it on the street light acquisition, which was, yep. it was about 38 grand to buy the, the, the street lights in the city of Brockton. We called that phase one under Belzotti's administration. And then when Mayor Carpenter came in, we filed a resolve and he supported it. And I know it's taken some time. And I know he, during his inaugural speech, he supported it, he confirmed it. Um, I, I think it's a no brainer. And, and I like the idea that you're extending it out, not just on the street lights. I, I know when I did my due diligence on it, it was about a 10 year warranty on the LEDs. And then the, in this case, the, the, the bond or the $4 million, if you amortize it, it pays for itself. What, what do you project that the, first of all, the cost savings you said is about a half a million dollars. On phase one on the street lights, I think year one was about 650 grand and it was reoccurring savings of at least a half a million bucks a year. So, so do, you, do you forecast that 500,000 um, year one or, or are you it's building it out into what year? What, what's, what's, where's the, the real savings? What year is that? Uh, about six, six years in. Six, six, years, six in. years in. Essentially, the beginning, the uh, debt service and the savings essentially offset. That's why there's no conditional certification. This is a, essentially a budget impact free uh, project because of the savings will offset the borrowing costs in the first six years. But then it's paid for in terms of the bond and the savings is free. And is the, is, the, uh, is the warranty still about 10 years on the LEDs? Yes, I think that's right, 10 years. And, and was, we still can use that also as a, as a public safety endeavor by height and light in some of the crime-ridden areas, Mr. Mayor? 
No, so, Council, as, as you point out, this is an initiative that's had the full support of the Council for some time. Yep. We're, we're getting to the next stage now so that the audit and design has been completed. Uh, and now we're ready to go forward with the council's approval with the RFP to actually do the borrowing and, and put out the RFP. So, so did you have to do, an, not to cut you off, but yeah. did you have to do an RFP on, on, on the, the actual? Um, we did an RFP on that. Yeah, we, did, did, we yeah. did an RFP on the, uh, on the design. And, uh, okay, yeah. okay. Do we know yeah. you were happy with that company or whatever it was? They, would they also be able to be considered going forward, or is it a different endeavor? It's, it's, it's really going to be two additional RFPs, one for the purchase of the actual hardware yep. and a second one for install and maintenance. So there will actually be two RFPs generated. One of the things that is, I mean, we're talking about 9,000 lights here. Uh, about 7,700 street lights, and then when you add in the schools and parks and playgrounds, you're around 9,000. The uh, grant from uh, National Grid will be almost a million dollars, so the actual cost to us is uh, only about 3 million, 3.1 million, and as Jay said, it's almost revenue neutral because the savings on the energy uh, come very close to offsetting uh, the payments, uh, the cost for the first six years. And then as you pointed out, it's a 10-year warranty on the fixtures with a payoff of six years. It's, it's an, as you said, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's win-win, but one of the big factors I think you're asking about is this will, uh, this will be a public safety benefit, reducing crime, particularly in business districts and, and even neighborhoods. And also with a lot of the emphasis that we've put on pedestrian and bicyclist safety, this has been part of the overall strategy on that for some time also because we know that these lights shine about 50% brighter than what we have right now while saving about 60% of the energy costs. So the, uh, the residents once installed will notice a significant improvement in the quality of the lighting. We'll also have a, a savings of internal man hours because of you know, we, we were capturing it in-house on a lot of the repairs and replacements as well, correct? Well, we've got a, we've got a contract with a company that uh, does most of that, but, uh, but right. But we'll, there'll be some yeah. more potential savings there. Okay. And my last question is the million dollar uh, for National Grid. I know when I spoke to Joe Cardinal last year, it was time sensitive. So have we locked in on that? Yeah. They, they have corresponded with us. They yeah. can. Yeah. Yes, and they've locked the, the, the number, the exact number, Council, is 904,000, and we've got that commitment now in writing from National Grid. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else? Council hey. Razak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, Mr. Riley, but I have an, another question for you. Hi. I should have asked you this earlier, but I just um, remembered. So. I have a few requests now that are going into your office for some lights, new lights. Will you be, will those be LED lights or are you, how are you, or well, will they it, still be the old no, lights? No, we'll probably just put the old ones because we still have to go through the RFP. So, I mean, if you can wait on the light, appreciate it. If you can't, then we'll get one up. Well, that's what I'm trying to think, trying to um, organize it so that way, how long would you say we would have to wait to get the new lights? Four months out. Jay. Yeah, yeah, but for the RFPs. I, I would say a couple of months, Council. A couple of months? Bef yeah, before we're up and ready to go. And then it'd be about how long to get them in? Eight to ten weeks to get the whole city done. So eight to ten weeks, okay. Um, and then um, my colleague has a question that I'm going to ask it for him. Are you going to replace a fixture for fixture or? Yes. Okay. Yes. The whole high sodium fixture that's on the arm has to come off and we put a new LED right in. We use the same structure. It'll be a lot smaller too, it's very, very small. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Rodriguez. So my question was actually if you're gonna replace fixture for fixture, meaning that if there's a light shining into a parking lot, are you gonna replace that particular fixture? If, if it's city owned, yes. So every single fixture that we have, we will replace every, with the every, LED. Yes. That's what I Yes, mean. we have about 7,700 street lights, 1,200 school, uh, the school lights, and a few odds and ends here and there. Yeah, we have about 9,000 lights we have to change out. 
Because we have some lights that actually are shining into like lots and things like that. Yes, Those we do. Will be replaced. Yes, a lot of the parks we do. We have the spots. Okay. All and right. actually, down at Perkins Park, we, we, were, we were a little ahead of our time. If you go down there, because the mayor wanted to light up the park a lot better now, yep. we did put some LED spots in there. So you, if you want to see how they work, they're, they're in there. Actually, I drove up. Sorry. Through Mr. Councilor Rodriguez. I yield, I yield to my council. I did drive by at night, and it was very well lit. Yes, so it was yes. So we did put, we, we started with that, yes. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, make a favor recommendation back to full council. Second. second. Motion made and seconded to recommend to the full city council favorably. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably. Item number 22. Resolved. The mayor or his designee, the collector, treasurer, and the city solicitor or his designee to be invited to appear before a committee of the city council to update council members on the status of the Whitman dispute in efforts to obtain payment. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conant, Chief Financial Officer, Martin Brophy, Collector Treasurer, Philip Nazrelli, and or his designee solicitor, Lawrence Riley, DPW Commissioner. Good evening, Attorney Federoff. Good evening. So I'm happy to report that we have been paid in full for FY13 um, by the town of Whitman. FY14 is currently being audited. That um, is close to finished. I want to say we're a few thousand dollars a part of a several hundred thousand dollar bill so we're very very close it was expected to be ironed out last week but due to unforeseen circumstances that meeting had to be canceled um, and for fy15 we're hoping that that will fall under the new contract we're very close in negotiations um, there was an illness on the whitman side which delayed things but we're we're quite close and we're just ironing out some some fine details excellent any questions? Recommendation? Move for favorable, regu uh, favorable recommendation. Second. Motion council. made and seconded to recommend to the City Council favorably. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably to the full City Council. Item number 23. Resolved that the city's mayor and solicitor come before the finance committee to provide a status update and to discuss reacquiring the real property located <coughs> at 226 Main Street, commonly known as the Gainley Building that was conveyed by the city for nominal consideration to the Commonwealth for purposes of using the property as a college collaborative. Invited on by Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor. Good evening, Mr. Nazarella. <laughs> Good evening. I was Much hoping someone else would here. step up. <laughs> um, I don't know. Do you have any questions? Just Jim, if they could, uh, just piece of information. I filed this resolve. I spoke to Mr. Nez Attorney Nezzarella about two months ago after the mayor came before us. Um, at that time, he said there really hadn't been any change. What, what I'm trying to trying to see, number one, is, is have we gotten any update relative um, to the status of the building? I know the mayor had indicated he'd rather have the state on their dime razz it, um, and then the city try to get it back. I, in my humble opinion, don't think that would ever happen. If the state spends money to rip it down, they're not going to give it back to the city of Brockton. So again, I mean, I've always been under the belief that we acted in good faith under the Pac Patrick administration. The current governor decided not to do what we were promised, and I'd like to see us get that building back and make it a city asset again. So I was wondering if we had any update from a legal perspective. Well, uh, I'm not sure if the last time the solicitor was here, he advised you all that we had sent out a notice um, to decam to abate. So that has been sent out. Um, so they're well aware of the situation. And I know the mayor has, as recently as last week, had a discussion with Lieutenant Governor Polito um, about the building. So it's really one of their higher priorities at this point. It's been put further on the front burner. So that's the status I can give you at this point. And thank you for that. But when you say I sent out a letter of abate, does that mean that we're giving them notice that the city would like to reacquire it, convey it back, or is it we would like to see the state rip it down on their dime? That, that the state would remove it on their dime because it's a liability at this point. Would we, again, and maybe you, I don't want to put you on the spot, so maybe you can look into it or, mm -hmm. or, or in collaboration with a law department, but it, I mean, common sense says if they're going to, I think the Kresge building was about 450 grand or so to take mm -hmm. it down. Um, so the Ganley building is even, even larger. So let's just say we're at a half a million dollars. That's I mean, exactly common right. sense says that the Commonwealth will not convey it back to the city of Brockton after it expends that kind of money. So we're going to have an eyesore in the core of the city of Brockton. So I guess my thought is when we give them notice, um, do we make it a conditional notice? 
I think the, the, the idea from the state's perspective is they want to make it a productive or, or, or nice showpiece for the city of Brockton. Um, it's not their intention at this point to tear it down and leave it bare. Um, their specific plans are not yet fully formed, so I don't want to go into those details. Yeah, and, and I can appreciate that, but I know when they ripped down Christos, mm -hmm. <laughs> with all good intention to put a $30 million health science building there for Massasoit, that's never happened. It's a skateboard sure. park now, and we don't want to see that in the city of Brockton. So, um, and I know we have a state rep, Mr. Calter, here tonight, so maybe he can convey this back to some of his colleagues as well, and I delegations on, on board with it as well. So thank you very much, attorney. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Thank Chairman. You. Any other questions, counselors? Recommendation? Favorable recommendation back to full second. council. Second. Motion made to second. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to move that. I want to postpone it to a later date uh, so that we can get a, a, a status update to see what the response is from the Commonwealth. I'd like to make a motion Building. to continue this to the next FENCOM in September, the first FENCOM in September. Second. There'll still be one. That's still summer schedule. Yep. So po the motion was made and seconded to postpone until the September finance meeting. All those in favor? Opposed? Postpone until September. Uh, item number 24 is on your agenda, councilors, but that should have been tabled at the last, uh, from the last meeting. So uh, actually, just to make sure we do this properly, could you read 24 and then we'll make a motion to table this. Resolve that the record owner of 121 Main Street, the mayor, superintendent of buildings, city solicitor, representative of the 21st Century Corp, Gary Leonard, be invited to appear, appear before a committee of this council to discuss the demolition of the building, the cost to the city, recouping the cost, and plans for the redevelopment of the property. Invited you, don't to, you don't have to read the invitees. Councilor Barnes, did you want to make a motion to uh, table this? Yes, I just want to let the, the people at home know and in the audience, several of the members of the Brockton Main Street Improvement LLC, they were here and they were um, prepared to update everyone. They have been working with the city very diligently um, and making sure that everything gets worked out with that building. Um, and they're very hopeful that they will continue to, uh, to work with the city and develop that building in some way or another. Um, they're about, I think he said, about three quarters of the way into a really, really good agreement with us um, to get that done. So um, I did want this table the last time, but unfortunately it, it was um, put on for here. So I apologize everybody that came um, in error, but I would like to table this going forward. Second. So motion is made and seconded to table. All those in favor? Opposed? The item is tabled. Thank you. Item number 25. Resolved to have members of the staff of the Brockton 21st Century Corp along with the Mayor Carpenter inform the City Council on current projects taking place to promote further economic development, new business, maintaining business, and other outstanding issues being faced by this organization. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Rob May, Director of Planning, Robert Jenkins, Brockton Redevelopment Authority, Michael Gallerini, Executive Director, Brockton 21st Century, John Marion, Chairperson, Brockton 21st Century Corp, Matthew Osborne, Treasurer, Brockton 21st Century Corp. Councilors, I did receive an email of Mr. Gallerani is uh, on a previously scheduled vacation. Uh, Mr. Marion and Mr. Osborne also had previous engagements and not here tonight. Mr. May, Mr. Jenkins, and the, uh, the mayor are here. Uh, who's, who filed this, Councilors? Council Beauregard. I did, and I find this very interesting. I want this to be duly noted. I contacted Michael Gallerini three times last week asking him to confirm if he would be here on Monday evening, July 18th, and he told me yes on Friday afternoon. I had left a message on a Sunday morning, and I had also, on that time, I did not hear back, naturally, and also um, during that week, I spoke with one, his associate, Gary Leonard, and I was told that he would be here. So I find this rather peculiar and a little frustrating because uh, throughout the evening we've been discussing uh, allocation of funds and here we are looking for more economic development. So I hope that, uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Jenkins to come up and maybe he can highlight um, any, anything going on maybe that would be in a positive light and bring uh, us, uh, how would I say, making us feel a little bit better about seeing a little bit more of an economic base in this community. Sure. Good evening, counselors. I'll keep this short. Um, Good idea. <laughs> I can only, I can't speak. I don't work for the Brockton 21st Century. I work for the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. However, we are working in cooperation with them in regards to the facade improvement program. Uh, April 1st was our first round of applications. We received six. Uh, three of them are being seriously considered. Um, we're also working with them on the Main Street uh, program, Campello Main Street program, which we're focusing in on now. 
Okay, let's talk about those facade improvement programs. Sure. Um, I can and where give you are a they? List of those applications. My board is very, <coughs> very demanding in regards to those properties that I've identified. Vicente's Market, 697 Main Street, 105 Main Street, which is Compu Math. Um, how detailed do you want? Can I just give the addresses? as opposed to what the plans are for those properties? Or would well, you like well, to you want, we want it highlighted a little bit, yes. Sure, Vicente's Market is looking to do their parking lot, their vestibule, making it handicap accessible. The one thing about Vicente's Market, 70% of their employees are low and moderate income. Um, the budget currently exceeds the amount of the program. However, we are considering, depending on what they come in with the budget, a renewed kind of valued engineer budget for the vestibule to increase that uh, through a waiver with the mayor and my board. Um, 105 Main Street is CompuMath, the corner of uh, Frederick Douglass Way and Main Street. Uh, his is mostly to do the exterior to take down the wrought iron fire escape, as you know, that's there that's pretty useless at this point in time. Some may even consider it dangerous to take it down. However, in order to do that, one of the conditions we're making upon him is that he has eight units inside that are not completed or occupied. We would like to see him get finance to occupy those eight units. The next building is also uh, 951 Main Street. It's the WGSC uh, Realty Trust. It's a small building next to the fire station on Main Street down in Campello. He's just looking to improve his, fa his facade. Uh, I think what he's looking to do in the application is put up Hardy Plank to redo some of the architecturals also on that small building. It's a small project, but it's an impact project down in Campello. The other uh, two projects that we're considering is the Tuxedo, uh, Tuxedos by Marion, 137 Main Street, 143 Main Street, which is the cross building as well. Exterior on those buildings will be, will be new lighting, repainting, signage, um, and mostly um, repointing of the brick, especially on the cross building. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, could we have Rob May up here for a moment, please? Good evening, Council. Good evening. Uh, since uh, you don't have your, and I use this term loosely, economic development uh, counterpart here, uh, I'm wondering, uh, because the last time that he had spoken in front of us, um, he had mentioned that there were items in the works, but he couldn't divulge the information. Evidently, um, this is kind of a CIA operative or something. And um, at the same time, once again, we're looking for revenue in this community. And I do have in front of me, and you know, people don't realize that, yes, as city councils, we do read what we receive. And this is the Brockton Economic Development Plan that we received during the budget. And uh, I have been going through it. And um, how would I say it? It seems a little bit redundant. And it keeps on emphasizing our low-income community, our diverse community, our challenges. But we don't seem to be, how would I say it, um, goal-driven. Uh, we don't seem to be solution-driven. And I, I find that very frustrating. I mean, 21st Century Corp has been with us for quite some time. Yes, not always with Matt Gallerani. And yet, over and over again, we do not see new businesses coming into this community. I'm not alone in this, I, I believe. Uh, you know, we're not seeing new businesses or something's supposed to come, and then all of a sudden it's halted. And again, we'll, we'll reflect on the Kresge building, for example, where, you know, we uh, seem to be missing. And um, this redevelopment of Brockton downtown, we were very excited about. Everything seems to have gone toward Camp Palo. Yes, I heard that the more grant funding went toward there, and I'm not against having development going to Camp Palo. What I am for, and I believe I'm not alone in this, is economic development taking place throughout the city. And this is where I feel, and again, I'm not looking at you to report this, so I'm going to Again, follow the resolve to have uh, Mike Gallerani come in front of it. And I believe this time, maybe I should have all the members of the board come in front, because I was told that there was going to be some changes with the B21 board and that we would see um, some solutions and um, some more activity, because this started with 
the frustration with Campanelli Stadium and the Shaw Center, but it continues to escalate that in all areas of this community and our downtown, we continue not to see enough, and uh, this is double negative, economic development taking place. So um, I feel bad that um, you're up in front here, but I hope that you can re relay this to everyone. And um, again, I don't, if I can ask my colleagues, can I ask um, to recommend favorably that uh, we postpone this to another finance meeting? I'll second that for you. Uh, on the motion. Uh, prior to the motion, there are some other councillors who have questions. So prior to the motion, okay. Councillor Barnes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, I just had a question. The six businesses that applied for the facade improvement program, they applied to BRA or to? No, to the BRA. It is the BRA program. They applied we to the BRA. Correct. Okay, so um, the executive director of B21 is eligible and there's not a perceived conflict of interest in that? You saying who the boat? Tuxedo oh. by Marion is one yeah. of the applicants. No, he is not. He's not, not the not executive director. Yeah. He's the executive director of Brockton 21st Century. No, he's, no, he's the, the chairperson of the board. He's a chairperson of the board. Of the board. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All right, just want to make sure. The chairperson of the volunteer board. The okay, yeah. volunteer, okay, just want to make sure. I didn't know how that, that worked out. No, right, he has no dealings with the BRA at all. Okay, so. I just want to make sure that there's no conflict. Guaranteed. Okay, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Right. Thank you for Excellent. the clarification. Thank you. Councilor Azak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jenkins, quick question. Mine's are easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure, how, how do businesses find out about the uh, facade program? How, how um, did you get these applicants? Where did they hear about it? And usually we do uh, flyers. We work a lot with the communities, especially with the, um, in what I call the business nodes, whether it's Campello Business Association, Downtown Business Association, Montello Business Association, we do flyers, our website, the city's website. Um, we try to get the word out to as many people as possible by best, best methods. Main Street Manager. Main Street Manager you okay. know. And out of like how many applicants did you have that um, I think would Out of the, the six, we had seven. We just disqualified one. So seven total? And seven total six. applicants. Okay. So do you feel that we could reach out to more? I mean, do you, it just seems here's like a, we have so many businesses sure. along. Um, here's, you know. a, it's, here's the thing. Um, as you know, because it's CDBG funds, we work in low income, moderate income census tracts. The mm -hmm. key here is, is to get those owners of the property. The one thing about a lot of our businesses, they don't own the property that they're operating. Right. Uh -huh. So it's okay. really tough, even Vicente's. They do not own the building that they want to do the facade improvement. It's outside, okay. Now, how is that? Because they also, they, um, there's another business there, I think a fish market, correct? So correct. how does, is that part That'd of the part of including, So yes. they're included in with that, okay. Correct. Very good, I'm sorry, hang on one second. Is there any more funds left for other businesses? Yes, we have another round coming October 1st. First. Very good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Anybody else? Uh, now I would entertain the motion to postpone till the next finance meeting. Is that your motion, Councillor? Yes. Second. Second. On the motion, if I could, uh, Mr. Motion. Chairman, I, I, again, I too am troubled by Mr. Gallarini. He indicated to two out of the 11, Mr. Lally and Ms. Warga, that he was going to be here. Um, and he sent a letter to you saying he's on vacation. So, um, you know, there's, there's something lost in translation there. And I, and I would venture to guess that perhaps the last time he appeared here wasn't the most pleasant experience for him due to his own, uh, own, <laughs> own actions. But I, 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 I would like to uh, applaud you, Councillor, and I, I would hope that uh, he, since he's a partner for the City of Brockton, an employee, that uh, he'll appear in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to postpone to the next finance meeting. All those in favor? All those opposed? Postpone to the next finance committee meeting. Item number 26. Resolved that the Brockton Water Systems Manager, a representative of the Brockton Water Commission, a representative of the Central Plymouth County Water District Commission, Mr. Alex Mansfield and Ms. Pine Dubois of the Jones River Watershed Association be invited to a meeting of the City Council to discuss issues affecting the quality and quantity of the city's water resources. The address of Jones River Jones River Watershed Association is 55 Landing Road, Kingston, Mass. Invited Lawrence Riley, DPW Commissioner, Brian Creedon, Water Systems Manager, Ossie Jordan, Water Commission, Paul Collis, 
Commissioner, Central Plymouth County Water District, Jack O'Leary, Commissioner, Central Plymouth County Water District, Alex Mansfield, Ecology Program Director, Jones River Watershed Association, and Pine Dubois, Executive Director, Jones River Watershed Association. Uh, and counselors, I did receive a letter from Paul Collis telling uh, Ms. Chuckman I received you a letter of July 1st, 2016. Unfortunately, I will be unable to attend this meeting because I will be out of state that week. Please pass along my regrets to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Federoff. Um, good evening, counselors. I would like to advise you that I have spoken with Mr. Creedon, Mr. Rowley, and Mr. Jordan and advise them not to speak to the city council this evening because we are currently in discussions with DEP. And as you all know, DEP is an enforcement agency and we're treating, although the discussions we have had to date have been cordial and I have to say quite productive and collaborative. Um, it's it, at this juncture, I feel it's inappropriate to have this discussion in a public forum. So I've advised them not to um, attend on this item tonight. And hey, Mr. Chairman. Council Farwell. I, I spoke with Attorney Federoff this afternoon. Um, Councilor Lally, by the way, took the initiative to schedule a meeting on July 1st about water resources, and we met with the town uh, administrator in Halifax and with the Board of Health agent, uh, and nothing was mentioned to us about any sensitive negotiations with DEP. When this was filed, this was simply a way of saying, look, we're starting an urban renewal plan. We're going to be increasing the housing density. We're going to be increasing commercial uh, development. And obviously, that's going to call for Brockton to uh, be sensitive about uh, water resources and our consumption. Um, I understand from Attorney Federoff that part of the problem is that some people apparently didn't treat Mr. Michael Sassine from Veolia very kindly. Uh, and I guess he runs the uh, water treatment plant down there. Uh, I have met with Mr. Mansfield and Ms. Dubois, and I assure you they have been nothing but professional and uh, cordial and informative. Uh, basically, they've applied for a grant, and they have some issues that they wanted to talk to us about. Um, you know, I can't talk about secrecy and not talking about something when I don't know the subject matter or what's going on. So um, I regret that they have stayed here this long. I thought you would find it informative to hear what they had to say. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm at a loss to comment because I never knew Brockton was in sensitive negotiations with the DEP about water. Um, I don't know what to say. It's, it's rather interesting. I, if this has been ongoing, you would think that we would have heard before mm -hmm. 3 o'clock this afternoon when Attorney Federoff called. I filed this on May 23rd. And now at literally the 11th hour, suddenly we shouldn't be talking about something which, frankly, I think the public might have a right to know. So um, my inclination is to at least allow Ms. Dubois and Ms. Demansfield to come up and tell about the grant they've applied for. We're not, and we're not going to take any action. We're not going to vote on anything. Mm -hmm. um, you, Mr. Chairman, certainly have the gavel if you feel that the the conversation from our guests is wavering into that area that uh, it shouldn't. I would obviously defer it to your leadership to, uh, to decide how to handle it. I would, uh, you, you did file this quite a while ago and we did just find that out this afternoon. I will allow discussion, but if I feel like we're getting into areas that may be detrimental to the city of Brockton, I will stop the conversation at that point. Uh, and that will be my decision and mine only. So, councilors, we'll, we will move forward. I'll allow the, uh, the three, three people who are here, Fine Dubois, Alex Mansfield, and Jack O'Leary, can speak and answer. That will be my decision and mine only. So, councilors, we'll, we will move forward. I'll allow the, uh, the three, three people who are here, Fine Dubois, Alex Mansfield, and Jack O'Leary, can speak and answer any questions that any councilors have. Uh, but again, uh, if I feel that we're getting into anywhere where it could be detrimental to the city of Brockton, I will be stopping the uh, conversation. But thank you much, and I thank you, uh, Ms. Dubois, correct? That's correct, sir. Thank you very much, uh, councillors. Uh, it's nice to be back, as they say. Um, 
Uh, as many of you know, um, I've been involved with your um, precious water supply for a very long time. I think it's uh, working on 40 years now. Um, and I can tell you um, that you really need to pay attention to it. That's why we uh, stayed so long tonight. It's also why we've worked so hard to, um, to both uh, work with a, par a broad partnership, which not only includes the Central Plymouth County Water District Commission, which was newly established. I think you may recall that it was first formed by the Acts of 1964 that allowed uh, uh, the city of Brockton to add to its water supply by diverting Munponset Pond in the Taunton River watershed and Furnace Pond in the North River watershed into Silver Lake, commingle that water and bring it up to Brockton 20 miles. Uh, I think those were the pipes you were talking about uh, a little while ago with Mr. Rowley in terms of replacing those because they're, you know, 100 years old, more or less. Um, the reason the Central Plymouth County Water District Commission was brought back together in, in the last uh, four years now, and uh, Jack O'Leary and uh, your representative Patrick Quinn are here tonight, and I think you, you would benefit from listening to them for a few minutes, um, is because your water supply, in, in particular Monponset Pond and Furnace Pond and Silver Lake, are becoming so degraded that you're at the risk of losing them. Um, and, um, you know, for somebody that's been involved in it for so long, uh, um, I, 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 I say this saying that it's new information. The, the degradation of your water supply um, means that you're losing it. You're losing Munponset Pond's ability to be diverted into Silver Lake, and certainly Silver Lake has been degraded over the time that I've seen it. So um, we applied for an EPA grant. Um, it was to the tune of uh, half a million dollars to work with the city of Brockton through the Central Plymouth County Water District Commission. The, the, di the commission was the applicant. Uh, Old Colony Planning Council was going to be the fiscal agent. Um, and we had eight towns, uh, six NGOs, and every state representative and uh, um, federal representative that uh, we could contact supporting the project. And what it was to do is examine your water supply, give you a, uh, a full and robust understanding of it factually, you know, collect all the information that has been done all over the years, um, do an economic analysis so that you could entertain alternatives. I found your discussion about Aquaria very interesting because when we were involved with the development of Aquaria, it was to be a di an additional supplement to Brockton, not an occasional one, not a 15 day a year one or 30 days a year, but every day of the year to add to Brockton supply because we knew, you know, um, in fact, DEP knew in 1986 when they issued the <coughs> emergency declaration that um, Brockton needed that supplemental supply. In fact, the acts of 1964 knew that. And so um, the eight towns of the Central Plymouth County Water District um, and your representative, Patrick Quinn, um, have been working hard to try to um, keep you from falling off the edge. Uh, but we can't do it. And when we write, we, the Jonesburg Watershed Association, come to you and say, we've got this $80,000 opportunity for you to learn something about your supply, and you guys vote for it, and then uh, the CFO X's it out of existence, we're at a loss for how to work with the city. And so we come again tonight. I want you to meet those people. We want to answer any questions you might have. We have a lot to say, probably more than you want to hear at this hour. Yeah, we're not um, going to go but, an hour or so. <laughs> but, I, um, but, but I do uh, think that uh, you need to meet with the Central Plymouth County Water District uh, Commission. The commission has authority over your supply, really. Um, and the towns uh, work through the advisory board. Uh, we, as the Jones River Watershed Association, have been working for the 30 years that we have been incorporated in, uh, on Silver Lake and on um, ensuring that you minimize the damage to the Jones River, which is um, 
uh, of critical importance to the entire Commonwealth. So Silver Lake is yours to use. It is not yours to own, to degrade, or to destroy. And um, so, Jack O'Leary, you want to come up? Patrick Quinn, how do you want to do this? Uh, well, Mr. Quinn would have to be under a suspension of the rules. And Mr. O'Leary, if you could tell me, uh, sorry, Commissioner of the Central Plymouth Water County District. Yes, I am, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having us, uh, having us here. We enjoy uh, uh, speaking with you on, this, on the subject. I don't think I can hold a candle to Pine's 40 years of experience in, in this matter, but uh, I do want to uh, emphasize that we ha uh, want to work with the City of Brockton. You're one of our member communities. Uh, we, we appreciate you sending your water systems manager to our meetings to, to inform us and have discussions with us about how the water supplies are managed. I think, I'd like to think we've had some success in, in managing the, with the diversions of Monponset Pond because when those diversions are, are suspended, we've lowered the toxic algae counts in the lake. Uh, this year though, we've had a bit of a drought and um, there's been some diversions uh, rather late in the season. We have a pretty high count and that is the, con the condition that Pine is alluding to. If we get that, uh, by diverting water from Monponset Pond into Silver Lake, that puts Brockton's water supply, original water supply in danger. And you really can't use Monponset Pond while those algae, algae blooms are occurring during the summer. And that was one of the purposes of that grant application, which unfortunately we didn't get, but we're certainly gonna try again. Um, but uh, I think also the city needs to start considering some water usage, usage restrictions in the summer, the, every summertime, because uh, we need to re reduce the demand on that water system to try and manage that toxic algae bloom and keep it from becoming a bigger problem. Thank you. Council Fowell, you file this. You have any I, questions? I'll, I'll defer to Council. Council uh, Lally. Hi, uh, I just want to to uh, to run something by, and I'm not. You know, actually, I'm going to refrain. I'm not sure if I'm al allowed to under under. Uh, you know, don't want to mess with the DEP. But another question, um, when, when do you guys have your meetings? I, I was intending to go to the last meeting. However, I was informed the day of, and I was unable to go to a, due to a prior commitment. Do you have a, a schedule online or something? Uh, I'm sorry, yo, I'm sorry, I apologize that. We did have a scheduling snafu. We had to do with posting the meeting notice in, in the holiday. But uh, we regularly meet. Let me just double check to make sure I give you the correct information. I do a lot of meetings. Um, we usually meet on the, pardon me, the fourth, uh, fourth Monday of every month, 3 o'clock at various locations, around at various locations around the district. Um, we do sometimes change that depending on commission member schedules. And it, it also is posted at, at, on, on, at City Hall. Okay. We send out notifications, but. Uh, um, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that's you all done, Council Lilly? Yeah. Council Farwell. Just a, just a couple of, I hope, yes or no questions so we don't get into it tonight. I, I, is anyone here aware of any issue involving DEP enforcement in the city of Brockton? Because I, I had not heard about it. I am not. Okay, Ms. Dubois? Uh, no, uh, no, no, we have not. And um, I know that DEP and Brockton have been talking, but I don't know about what. So, um, okay. you know, uh, there's that, but. All right, well, I, I'm gonna make a suggestion with, with great respect for you sitting here and going through the meeting, but I think it's really important that to get a balanced view of things. We don't have our water commission here. Um, there are some other people who were invited and who uh, could not be here tonight. And even though it's kind of going to abbreviate tonight's meeting, it is so important to just have all parties who are stakeholders uh, present to have a full discussion. So I'm going to move that we uh, table this until a meeting in, se oh, I'm sorry. I'll move to table until September, and then if people have uh, questions, I'm going to can... ask you to hold your motion, and okay. you don't want to table it. You want right. to postpone it, because once we make a motion to table, we can't have any more discussion. All right. So before I take your motion, Councilor Rezek. You had suggested at the beginning that under suspension of the rules, we could possibly have Mr. Patrick Quinn, since he is our representative and he has sat through this whole meeting, if we could have him. If there's us... no objection, he can speak. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Quinn. Good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Patrick Quinn. I am your representative, the City of Brockton's representative to the Plymouth County Water District Commission. And just for the record, I was not invited here tonight. 
Yet for some reason, the city council, acting as a finance committee, chose not to, not to invite Brockton's own representative to, to the Plymouth County Water Commission. And as your representative, my foundation is making sure Brockton's represented properly within this water district. I am not aware of any sensitive negotiations between the DEP and Brockton, not to mention that how you define sensitive, anything can be sensitive. But for me to say that, that, that there's any negotiations going on right now where other Brockton representatives, that is people who have been hired to be the caretakers of this water system, can't show up to, at, to answer questions that you elected officials are asking of themselves, I find to be totally irresponsible of their positions. Um, there's a lot we could say about water, but the one thing that I will say is that especially when you talk about developing downtown in the city of Brockton, there's no question as we move forward in wanting to have more economic development and economic growth in our city that Brockton will definitely need to find more water. Silver Lake is at its max capacity. If not, we're already taking too much water. So what I will say in this is that, is that as we move forward in any type of planning for the future of Brockton, we will definitely need to be taking water outside of the Silver Lake area. If not, it be the desal plan or MWRA, there's no question that Broughton needs to find more water beyond conservation. Um, but I'm willing to, to answer any questions that any of the councillors might have. I was a Broughton Water Commissioner during the debacle of the water meter issue that, uh, that we saw the city go through some very negative um, press and, and negative management that we got through and then I became a Plymouth County Water Commissioner. So if there's any questions about the water system between Brockton and these other parties that are involved, I'd be more than willing to answer those in the public forum or privately at any time. Thank you. Any questions, Councilor, or do only make a motion? I, I have a question. Councilor Barnes. I have a question, yes. Um, this is probably for either Ms. Dubois or for you, uh, Mr. Quinn. So of the eight communities that are um, that make up this um, water district is Brockton kind of the um, the most derelict I guess and the usage usage of water or is it our fault I, I mean um, I, uh, no, no you know I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put blame on any one community what I would do is I would say I'd go back to 1964 the law in which the Massachusetts legislator created um, the water district, the Plymouth, the Plymouth Central County Water District, which are those eight towns, at a time when Brockton was, I would say, mismanaging its water resources that went into the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. And what happened was that that, that, gave, that legislation gave Brockton the right to acquire more water within the region, mm -hmm. but also wanted the region to oversee the water system and not just let Brockton manage the water system, but let them manage it on an everyday, day-to-day -day business, but let the region, as is the Plymouth County Water Commission, to oversee the region as, a, as, as, a, as the bigger authority. And right now we're in between whether or not we have authority or not over the Brockton Water Department, which I believe, as do my other commissioners and other communities around in the, in the district, believe that the state legislature actually give the Plymouth County Water Commission oversight of the Brockton Water, Water Department. That is not to say who they hire, what they do, but how we manage the water resources. And as you go forward and we talk sensitively about the water resources, there's some major things happening in our water resources with cyanobacteria that are affecting Montponset Pond that's getting into our water system that's happening all across the country that actually has been happening since the early parts of our water system. I've been reading old Water Commission reports from the 1890s, and this stuff's been happening naturally throughout over 100 years. But now as developments happened, we are exacerbating the issue f m for more so than it just naturally happening by our managing of the water and by our development. And that there are solutions that we're willing to bring forward that we're hoping the Brockton Water Department will work with us in understanding that these sensitive issues need to be solved for a better future for tomorrow. Right, and, and I ask that because I was, I attended the, the legislative kind of tour that you had uh, Mr. Bois a few months ago down there and we saw the fish ladders and all of those things, the lever, the little house, the lever right. that we have and all of those things. And um, at that particular time, I know that uh, State Representative Dubois, she had meant she uh, voiced her opinion very strongly um, about kind of, you know, how she felt about what was being asserted. And I, I agreed with her at that time and it did feel that um, Brockton was kind of being blamed for um, a lot of the 
the current conditions, you know, based on some things that, you know, as you said, have been happening for 100 years. So um, I just wanted to be clear about that. Well, I, you know, uh, I think some people might be taking more politicalness out of the conversations. I don't think these groups inside the district are simply blaming Brockton for the problems, but there's definitely some blame to be put into Brockton's non-compliance and listening to solutions and actually getting things done to solve the issues than simply saying, this is the way I've been doing it for 30 years, this is the way I want to do it tomorrow. I just want to make sure there's enough blame to, to you know, be handed out, be dealt out to Oh, there's no question. We're, we're, we're all, we're all responsible. I don't want to say we're all to blame, but we're all responsible. And sometimes you have to rethink how you yourself do things. And I think with my role as, as, as Brockton's representative to the Plymouth County Water Commission and the district, is I've come to realize that both all the parties need to kind of sometimes think about redoing things a little differently. And especially in the Brockton, Brockton side of it. There's no question about it, what I've witnessed over the years. And I'll give you an example. When I was a Brockton Water Commission, and we had a former DPW commissioner telling the entire community that we only had a certain amount of, of estimated bills and that we don't get the bill that, that the public had to tell us whether it's estimated or accurate, which is totally a lie. You know, we had 8,000 estimate reads one quarter when we were being told we only had 300. So my past experience leads me to believe that yes, sometimes Brockton is to blame. Okay, thank you. I just yeah. wanted to be clear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, did, Mr. Bois, did you want to answer that or address? I'm sorry. I'm Excuse me. Uh, yeah. I would. Chair we're Mr. starting sorry. to get into discussions that I think are what there is. There is discussion about actually where this authority comes from, and who has the authority. That I think is what the DEP is looking into. I just want to. Oh, yeah. I mean, if they want to talk about the grant and the application for the grant, but uh, I don't want to go too far off on some of the issues we're starting to ask about. Well, rather, rather than talk about authority of, of the district and stuff, let me introduce Alex Mansfield, uh, who works for the Jones River Watershed Association. He actually oh, sorry, works for who? Jones River Watershed Association. He's our ecology program director. He's on the mm -hmm. invited list. Um, because Alex has an ability to talk about how um, the water is being moved and might um, express an understanding for, for, um, for the question that you had. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I love the I'm going to hear about grants. Are we going to hear about grants? Yeah, and yes, sir. I, I agree that it's. A, I'm not happy that Time the uh, three Brockton Water Systems people were told just uh, but today. But to start getting into how water is being moved and all without them here to talk about it, I, I, I'm going to have trouble with that. So I'm going to sure. entertain Councilor Farwell's motion at this point. Well, May I just quickly address? Excuse me, I run the meeting, Mr. Bois, not you. I'll let you talk for a minute, but I don't want to get into how water is moving. I'll, I'll skip that question. Um, just to address the grant you asked about, Please, we, did, we did not receive that funding from EPA. We just had a um, debrief uh, with them, this call believer. with them this week. Um, but the, the issues related to that grant, the, the reasons why we applied for it, the reasons why it was supported by so many, such a broad audience, um, I think really speaks to the, the need for it. So um, although it was not funded, the need still is there and we continue to pursue that. Um, I'll leave it at that. We did take, um, we, we did know that our time was gonna be short tonight. So put together just a one page description of some of these issues, if I may hand it out to the- uh, Sure, actually the you can give it to the clerk right here. If there's any other questions, I can answer them, but. Well, I think, if I could, Mr. Chairman, I, I just think it's really important to have all parties here. It, it's, uh, it, it's very disappointing what happened tonight, particularly where these folks have patiently waited. So I'm, I'm going to move to postpone further discussion until a FinCom meeting in September, at which time we will have uh, the parties who are here tonight and the Brockton Water Commission invited. Hopefully any sensitive issues have been resolved by DEP by then and the council will have a better understanding of what's going on. And we will make sure ahead of time that we know who's going to be here and who's not going to be here. Uh, do I have a second on that? Second, I'll second it, but I'd also like to see that um, on that agenda um, that it's put to the forward, uh, you know, one or two on the agenda 
I also am troubled that our well, elected officials. Well, to resolve, officials, so we'll have to be. At yeah, the end I mean, of the I'm, I'm, poor John Buckley's been here all night. Yeah, exactly. I'm dismayed Those that resolves. he's the last on the agenda. Unfortunately, under Robert's rules, the resolves will be at the end of the night. So the motion has been made to postpone to the September finance meeting. All those in favor? All those opposed? Uh, postpone to the September finance meeting. Item number 27. Resolve to have Matthew. Uh, excuse me, before I. Uh, uh, my uh, fault, uh, Representative Coulter, I didn't know that's who you were. I'd like to make sure that we, uh, in the record, Representative Coulter from Kingston was here. I apologize, I didn't know that's who you were. Thank you. Item 27. Resolved to have Matthew Zaylor of the Trinity Financial Corp and any other individual from this company to update the City Council as to the development of a parking garage. To have Matthew Zaylor of the Trinity Financial Corp and any other individual from this company to update the City Council as to the development of a parking garage at the Enterprise Block and any information regarding a restaurant inside this establishment. Invited Matthew Zaylor, Trinity Financial Corp. Yeah, that's a, Robert sorry. H. Malley. Sorry, my fault. I received notification from Mr. Zala that he is out of town tonight and could not, could not attend. Motion, motion to postpone agenda item 27 to September. Excuse, excuse me, this is Councillor uh, Beauregard, I believe. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I filed this, and I'm sorry, Councillor Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor. Sullivan. I didn't know who filed it. I just wanted to make it clear that he informed the chair that uh, he was not coming. I had spoken with him. He was going to have a meeting with me today and come. At the last minute on Friday afternoon, he cancels and says something has come up. This is the second time we've tried to have him come up in front of City Council and Finance Committee. And what I want the public to know and my colleagues to be made aware of, let's remember, we're looking at revitalizing downtown. And here's one of our large components that has been here for one year and, does, and, and is avoiding us in front of uh, this, this uh, committee, and uh, we have questions on the present and uh, the future of this uh, operation, and I just want to make that clear. So, yes, thank you. If anyone wants to postpone this. Council, uh, yes. put information through the chair. Uh, we battled uh, Trinity a few times in the past, the legislative. One of the ones, and it came to fruition, it's beautiful now, is the Korean War Memorial. But before you got elected to the council, we fought many, many times yeah. with the officials at Trinity. Um, so stay the course and keep fighting them, and eventually they'll appear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor, you want to make a motion? Yes, I'll make a motion that we postpone this till the September Finance second. Committee meeting. Second. 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 You made a second to postpone till the September Finance meeting. All those in favor? Opposed? Postpone to September. Item number 28. Resolve it. Until you join. <laughs> <laughs> Resolve that the chairman of the Board of Assessors report to the City Council on the process and steps followed in assessing the value of homes in the city. Invited John O'Donnell, Chairman of the Board of Assessors. We also received word from Mr. O'Donnell. He is out of town tonight. Yes, uh, I, want, I would like to speak on that because I wish to postpone this to the um, August Finance Committee meeting, but I do want to make everyone aware that, um, no, I'm sorry, I'll take the September Finance Committee meeting because the um, assessor chair informed me that they have a new software and that we will be receiving uh, our inf information. They're being trained on it, and uh, at this uh, will be a, a better time for them to explain to us their program. So I make the motion the that we postpone second. this. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to postpone until the September Finance meeting. All those in favor? Yeah. All those opposed? September finance meeting. Could you read item number 29? Resolved that the Plymouth Registry of Deeds be requested to appear before a committee of this council to provide information on the current status of foreclosures within the city. Invited John R. Buckley, Jr., Esquire Registry of Register of Deeds, Plymouth County. John, you're a patient man. <laughs> well, sometimes you're lucky to be last. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, thank you for the invitation, counselors. In particular, Councillor Beauregard had called me and asked me to come. Um, I'm going to try to make it short. Here's a copy of a document that I a couple other people because I think it's important to know not only what I'm saying, um, but what are the actions that organizations are taking to help the foreclosure problem. And I, and I say that uh, because we still have a foreclosure problem. Um, I have uh, Robert Jenkins here with us from the BRA, 
Cindy Pendergast, a housing counselor from Neighbor Works, Southern Mass, and Joel Hirschman from a program called the DPIR program. It's a distressed property program funded by uh, the Attorney General's office. So um, just quickly, because I know you've had a lot of information tonight, um, I provided you with a list of foreclosure deeds and orders of notice. Uh, just by way of quick background, I am the Register of Deeds, which is in, in charge of the recording agency of the 27 communities within Plymouth County. Uh, we have offices in Plymouth, the satellite office over on West Elm Street in Brockton, and a satellite office in Rockland, and we record real estate documents. Um, in particular, we record sales of property, which are deeds, mortgages, and foreclosure deeds and foreclosure notices. A foreclosure deed is a document that gets recorded after someone has gone through the entire foreclosure process and an individual has lost title to their property. A foreclosure notice is the first document we receive at the registry that basically is starting the process towards a foreclosure deeds, a deed rather. And you might have read you know, various um, news reports, various news reports about the foreclosure crisis reoccurring. Uh, there was a drop off um, over the years. 2008, the crisis began. Mm -hmm. uh, since 2008, it's kind of gone up and down, and it's gone down for 2014, started to go up again for 2015, and you can see mm -hmm. with the first six months of this year, the numbers are up again. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a tragic thing. Yes. People are losing their homes. It's impacting neighborhoods, and it's really deteriorating uh, People's, uh, within a mile of the neighborhood, they say uh, foreclosure can bring down your property values. Brock Brockton's valuation has dropped like a rock, and part of that has become because of foreclosures. Uh, so uh, we have chosen at the registry to track that information, share that with agencies that can help people, and um, try to um, mitigate the problem. Uh, to move on pretty quickly, and then maybe we'll I'll take questions at the end. Uh, we prepare these reports, and we share them with groups that are out there to try to help people modify, modify their loans. Cindy Pendergrass, who's from NeighborWorks, is one of those individuals who's a hands-on person to do that. And I'd just like to beg your indulgence for a, a two-minute presentation from her as to what they ask, just so you know, if you have somebody out there in trouble, where to send them. Cindy? If there's no objection. No. And just to let you know, the sound may be terrible in here, but they can hear it at home. Oh, good. So, thank you. So once again, I'm with NeighborWorks Southern Mass, and we're an organization, no nonprofit, that's been around for over 30 years. We moved into Brockton in 2008 to help out with the foreclosure crisis at that time. And very quickly, we, re we realized that partnering with the Registry of Deeds and these notices going out would be a great thing. You know, here's someone getting the bad news. Why not show them that there's help mm -hmm. available? So what we do is uh, Mr. Buckley's office sends us the actual notices and envelopes. We insert a flyer of what we can do to help mm -hmm. in with that notice. And so when the, the homeowner opens it up, they're getting some bad news, but then they're, they're getting some help. So when we send out those notices, my phone rings. I'm the intake person for the foreclosure um, clients. And so it's a, a really great thing. Um, the other thing that we do in the city that's to prevent foreclosure is we do home buyer education because an educated home buyer is a sustainable homeowner. And so those are some of the great things that we do. Thank you. So the Attorney General's Office have been great partners with us. They have funded a program uh, where they, we actually, through the BRA, uh, who, who manages the grant, actually f tries to force the lenders to list these properties once they've been foreclosed upon. So um, it's a very important part of it. Obviously, we want to help and keep as many people as we can in their homes, 
but once they've been foreclosed upon, uh, you want the property as fast as you can uh, to go out into the marketplace. And uh, Joel, can Joel Hirschman for a quick minute? If there's no objection. No. Uh, yeah, I'm the DPI, our uh, coordinator. Um, what happens is when I was first hired by the, uh, <clears throat> by the BRA um, through the Attorney Generals, their whole program is to get banks to move on their properties to get them back on the market. Um, I started with 2008. I made a spreadsheet of all foreclosures from 2008 up to the present, <clears throat> did a title search, and basically found out which houses were still owned by banks. Then, according to the uh, AG's um, protocol, I would send an email or call or uh, do a certified letter to the bank saying to respond to me, telling me what they're going to be doing to get that property on the market. They would tell me, um, I would make note, for instance, uh, a lot of these properties are occupied. They would tell me that they're going to go for eviction. So I tr kind of try to track the evictions uh, online. Um, <clears throat> and I keep monitoring, monitoring those properties um, until they're actually sold. And then I transfer them to another file where uh, they're sold, they're back on the market. Um, I also, um, so that's my number one priority um, to Find the foreclosure deeds. I download them from the um, attorney uh, from the registry of deeds. I find out if they're still owned by the banks, and I contact the banks. Uh, another part is the receivership program, in which the attorney general's office um, can go into court um, and take away properties. Ask the judge to take the property uh, from the bank. I uh, put it in, into the hands of a receiver. A lot of times it's the BRA. Uh, the property is then fixed up. The bank is presented with the bill. If they don't pay it, um, the receiver has a super lien over the bank and the super lien can be foreclosed and then the BRA would auction that property off. If no one buys it at auction, the BRA then gives it to a realtor who will um, uh, sell, sell the property um, preferably to affordable uh, housing for low-income people. Um, I also involved with the Click Fix program. Um, as you know, the city has the Click Fix program. People can report abandoned and vacant properties. I get an email on vacant and abandoned properties. I then go out. I look at the property. Um, I find out um, if the people are still uh, who own it. Also, I contact the bank saying that you have a piece of property that's abandoned for four or five years. What are you doing to get this property back on the market? Um, and then I take all the data I have and suggest certain properties that might go into receivership. So that's a quick survey of all the things that are going on. Uh, Council Beauregard invited me to share this information to make sure you knew that the foreclosure crisis still continues, but she also wanted uh, me to mention that so that anyone watching this show on television would be aware. And I guess we'll leave it with, if anybody out there watching this show or anyone you know is facing foreclosure, having difficulty, it's far better to not wait, but just to take action. Go to a federally author authorized housing counselor, talk to them about your options, and, and once again, that is subsidized by the federal government and um, it's free. So take advantage of that. Councilors, just want to check, are there going to be many questions? Because we have about two minutes left on the tape. Otherwise, Councilors, just want to check, are there going to be many questions? Because we have about two minutes left on the tape. Otherwise, we're going to have to take a re uh, recess. Uh, Council Beauregard, you file this. I file this because every month I receive one of these. I don't know from whom, but it's dropped off on the front lawn, and it's foreclosures. And I've been watching this closely and just seeing these alarming figures. I wanted to be proactive instead of reactive, and I believe this information is vital to not only the counselors but the, the community, and I just defer to my colleagues. 
Thank you. Councilor Rezac, did you have yes. something? I just have a quick comment. I would just like to congratulate you. Um, this is a great collaboration. I've heard a lot of good things about this group and about getting the information out to people. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. Councilor Sullivan. I, I just want to thank, uh, thank Mr. Buckley for being here. Um, you know, John lives in Brockton. We're very fortunate to have him. The county is, and, and it, being the Plymouth County Advisory Board member from Brockton, uh, John and his staff have done wonderful things with really decreased financial endeavors and loss of jobs. So, John, thank you for what you do and everybody else here. We really appreciate all your efforts. Thank and you. your cable show is the best. Well, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Attorney Buckley, thank you so much and your whole crew for your patience tonight. And it was a long night. Motion uh, favorable. Second. Yeah. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, and before we finish for the night, councilors will have council Monday night. I will be out of town on business. Councilor Sullivan will be running the meeting. I don't want to get any bad reports. <laughs> Good behavior. <laughs> any other business? We're adjourned.